Are you searching for the best in online black radio? Then go to blacktalkradionetwork.com, helping you filter through the noise. Real talk, black talk. The internet is full of half-truths and all-out lies. We've all seen them, and many people on social media complaining about it. Here's your chance to show and prove. WorldAfropedia.com is a black-owned and operated encyclopedia. There are several thousand articles, but we need help. We can't uncover all the truth ourselves. So please, join us and become a writer, editor, or blogger for WorldAfropedia.com today. Every little bit counts. We owe it to the future generations to put the truth out there. Visit WorldAfropedia.com, the African-centered encyclopedia, a global database of African knowledge for the purpose of bringing about global African wisdom and understanding. WorldAfropedia.com One of Greenville County's most notorious crimes and the justice that never followed will be commemorated today with two historical markers. Uh, history books will record the 1947 lynching of Willie Earle as an unsolved murder, but today the acquittal of the 28 suspects, viewed by many as one of the darker days in the upstate. This is for Sean Mozzarella, live and local outside the old Greenville County Courthouse. That's where one of these markers will go up, because, Sean, that's where a lot of this story takes place. It's exactly right, Gordon and Beth. Uh, what took place here in 1947 was Willie Earle's trial, and then uh, that's why a historical marker is going up over here, and then the next one is going to go up on Bramlett Road. That's where Earle was lynched. Let's go back to 1947 and talk about what happened there. That's when Willie Earle was arrested. He was accused of the murder suspect uh, of a white cab driver in February of that year. Well, a few days after being thrown in jail, an angry mob went to the jail, got Earle out, and then beat him and shot him to death on Bramlett Road. Strom Thurmond was governor at the time and promised swift justice. Well, 28 cab drivers were, you know, quickly arrested and put on trial here at the old courthouse, but historians say uh, those cab drivers signed confessions, even bragged about it, but after a two-week trial in front of an all-white jury and national press attention, the jury deliberated for five hours and returned not guilty verdicts on all of those men. So uh, today's ceremony, there's going to be family members of Willie Earl here. There's going to be historians, lawmakers, pastors. Uh, the organizers say the point of this event is to really encourage healing and reconciliation throughout, not only the not only for the Earl's family, but for the entire upstate about this event. I'm Sean Muswell to be YPAF News for today, live and local in Greenville. Context Greenville. of white supremacy. Gus T. Renegade in for another broadcast, hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy. Today's date, Tuesday, May 30th, 2017. So I have been told, uh, have to, just for context, uh, we have been here uh, working on not our ninth year. Uh, one of our favorite characters, uh, his name doesn't come up in this story, but anytime the state of South Carolina is mentioned, mandatory, I am obligated to mention, former governor, co-founder of Clemson University, Benjamin Pitch Fork Tillman, my favorite quote of all time on the program, the threat of Negro domination hangs over us like the sword of Damocles. Uh, we did his <laughs> biography uh, back up. Uh, Right after the massacre in Charleston, uh, we did in the summer of 2015, uh, Ben Tillman and the Reconstruction of White Supremacy. Grand text to keep in mind uh, as we cover the events on today's broadcast. I uh, heard about just a brand new book again, Dr. Frances Cress Welsing. Uh, she encouraged us so many times. Reading is more important than watching television. Amen. You can say that as many times as possible. And particularly, I know we have some listeners who uh, are South Carolina residents. I've said this all the time. Really make an effort to know your uh, local history. Uh, that can be one way uh, that you can do something constructive. You can make it a family activity or personal uh, activity. Uh, and you can learn about the history of white supremacy racism. Uh, if you are a listener in South Carolina, you should know who Willie Earl is. You should know about this incident. And this is something that you can use to teach about racism, white supremacy, and to add context uh, when you have events like Dylan Storm Roof. White Terrorist, Charleston Massacre. Uh, the program, uh, or our guest uh, for today's broadcast, <clears throat> uh, has a brand new book 
just came out uh, this year, uh, Who Lynched Willie Earl? Uh, folks who listen to the compensatory call-in on the weekends, uh, we had a news segment uh, where he was a guest on another person's program, and I was intrigued uh, because he was talking about this uh, lynching that happened in 1947, which is hugely significant, not ancient history, uh, something that happened. This is the same year that Jackie Robinson, uh, quote-unquote, integrated Major League Baseball that this happened. Probably got some listeners who might have been alive at that time. And he also, uh, in addition to talking about this case and what it reveals about white supremacy, he said that he also used this book as a chance to reflect on his own participation as a white man in the system of racism, white supremacy. So I was very interested, glad we could get him on the program. Uh, In addition uh, to writing the book that we're going to discuss this evening, he is professor of the practice of Christianity at North Carolina's Duke University. Uh, He also served as dean of the Duke Chapel, uh, Dean of Duke Chapel and Professor of Christian Ministry for two decades. Uh, He's written over 60 books, uh, holds a litany of honorary degrees. Real pleasure to have him on the program. Joining us live, Professor William Willimon. Professor Willimon, you with us, sir? Thank you, Gus. Thank you. Glad to be with you. Thank you so much for uh, joining spending a bit of your Tuesday evening with us. Uh, just for folks, I'm sure this is their first time hearing from you, for some folks. Uh, any information you would like to share about who you are, the work that you do? Well, I am uh, have been around Duke University for a number of decades. I'm, <clears throat> I'm a United Methodist bishop and served as Bishop of Alabama for about eight years. So I have spent my whole life in the Southeast. And the story of Willie Earl is a story that is uh, all too typical of the history of the Southeast and uh, the South, uh, which I grew up in and nurtured me. And I <clears throat> noticed in the book that I, I tell the story of I was a freshman at Walford College, a uh, sophomore at Walford College, and a history professor said to me, oh, you're from Greenville. Uh, yeah, that's where they had that lynching when you must have been a baby. And, in fact, uh, the Willie Earl lynching occurred when I was one year old. And I said, lynching? I have heard of any lynching in Greenville. He, the professor, Sir Riley, said, well, you only lived there 18 years. I guess you couldn't get around to everything. Uh, but it was about the biggest thing ever happened in Greenville and the trial afterwards. So that began my journey with Willie Earl, uh, which I lived in Greenville 18 years, never heard it mentioned, and yet it was certainly the most historical, noteworthy event in Greenville. Um, And so the the lack of memory, the lack of ownership of that, the belated uh, recognition about this double evil that occurred in Greenville, is sort of part of the story of Willie Earl. Hmm, Fascinating. We will get to that uh, in your own personal, I guess, for listeners to make sure for folks who have not seen you, you are a white man. Is that correct, Professor Willimon? I am. Mm-hmm. I am. I have a white male southerner. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. And even though you were born, uh, you're a South Carolina native, you're actually in North Carolina now. Is that correct? Uh, I am. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you, your grasp of South Carolina history is impressive. It's so rare to find people who are willing to remember Pitchfork Ben Dillman, but oh, that's my guy. Worth remembering, <laughs> absolutely. Well, they got a statue of him, so I mean, how could we? I think oh, a lot of a people. Statue, they've got buildings, a name for him. At absolutely, Clemson, uh, university, and absolutely. University and, Winthrop uh, University as well. I mean, he's st- they didn't take his memorabilia down at the state house, even though they did take down the Confederate flag. I remember they did not, that. and he was. Uh, he was one, as, as you know, of a long uh, history of white populist, so-called, um, uh, but uh, white supremacist. Uh, and in our present political climate, that, that brand of politics seems to be uh, rising again. So it's it, all the more reason we need to remember. Absolutely. That brand of white supremacy politics is always in fashion, uh, in my view. Uh, Before we get started, uh, all of our guests, I ask them, I think uh, racism, white supremacy, uh, I use those two terms as synonyms, and I use the same definition for both terms. Uh, The definition I use Mm -hmm. is as follows. A global system of people who classify themselves 
as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they classify as not white. Do you believe such a system exists? And do you think that definition is accurate? Uh, I do. Uh, painful, <laughs> but accurate. Uh, I think that's a, that's a good definition. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, uh, the whole, in my book, I get into just a little bit and I'm, of, of the history of the, the creation of whiteness and uh, as a designator of human beings, uh, it is a designation that, of course, uh, people of color didn't come up with, uh, but rather white people came up with as part of European colonization and the European Enlightenment. Um, yeah, I, I notice as a Christian that though Christians have sure been guilty of uh, capitalizing on, plugging into, giving theological justification for the notions of white supremacy. It, it is a concept, best I can find, uh, that was created during the decidedly unchristian European Enlightenment. Uh, and the connections between that and slavery and uh, colonization are undeniable. So I think that's a good, and I think it's so important for white people to name uh, things as they are and to notice uh, the sort of systemic, social, structural implications of all this, uh, which I get into some in the book. Uh, I noted that a lot of white Christians think of racism as a kind of personal problem. And they say, gosh, I've grown out of racism, or I've overcome racism, or I don't have a racist bone in my body. And, and yet that uh, usually overlooks the kind of social, systemic ways that so many things are set up um, by unacknowledged but nevertheless real white supremacist intentions like the tax code and the Constitution, well, we could go on. Right. I will, I'll just hop in uh, again. Uh, <laughs> you did acknowledge that the definition is accurate, uh, that such a system uh, does exist. Very important. Uh, I have questions that I want to try to get to. I hope we can cover as much as possible. Uh, one of the things that I've noted uh, many times in conversations on white supremacy, when talking with a white person, a lot of times white people, for a variety of reasons, sometimes I think it's to deliberately <clears throat> practice racism. Uh, white people will obfuscate, pussyfoot, uh, they will not answer questions or they will be very loquacious in answering questions where they've talked and talked and talked and not mm -hmm. really answer the question. So if you could be as efficient as possible uh, and as accurate as possible, I think as you just said, for white people being accurate and calling things as they actually truthfully are, uh, if we could have as much honesty, efficiency as possible. A uh, lot of questions I want to get started with. I've been asking white guests this for a while now. There's a non-white author. He wrote a piece in the New Republic talking about racism. And this is a sentence that he wrote. I want to get your opinion to see if you think it, this is honest. He said that white people are often sincerely and greatly pained by racism, but rarely are they pained enough. Uh, and I just the first portion of that sentence, I want to know you as a white person. So the family member, your white family that you've been around, white friends, your study, uh, the history of white people worldwide. Do you think that a significant portion of white people are often sincerely and greatly pained by racism? Do you think that's true? I think that's true. I think that's true. I think, though. Uh, the second part of, of the author's um, uh, analysis is also true. Uh, maybe it's human nature to avoid pain uh, and to flee from pain, and yet uh, the truth <laughs> is often painful and but but essential. Uh, my book is really sort of uh, it, it's addressed primarily, I, I would think, to preachers, Christian preachers. And saying to Christian preachers, here's a conversation we have got to have in churches 
And um, I, I sort of say in jest, but, uh, you know, one thing preachers do is put people in pain. That's, <laughs> that, that could be defined as a purpose of a sermon, mm-hmm. is to put people in appropriate pain, of the truth sometimes causes pain. And, um, and therefore, we need to have this conversation. But I think it is a conversation white people flee from and deny well, and wait a minute, is, wait a minute, wait a minute. The, yeah. the, your your answer is not making sense. And any time that that happens, when I'm talking to a white person about something where I've asked a you know a question and I suspect that they might not be untruthful with me, I suspect you could be practicing racism here deliberately, uh, Professor Willimon. Um, huh. Now, the question that I asked, do you think that this is true yeah. of a sizable portion of white people? White people are often sincerely and greatly pained by racism. And you said, I think it's true that a sizable yeah. number of white people are pained, and then you continue to talk yeah. about how white people flee things that are painful, that might be human yeah. nature, and it's the job of preacher to confront people. You, it started to move away from the question, and then you said actually that oh. a lot of white people are not even willing to have this conversation. Now, to me, that sounds yeah. like, if that's true, that they're not really sincerely and greatly pained about racism that's what it sounds like to me and i would even uh, pause hang on one second hang on yeah. one second hang on one second yeah. and yeah. i pause because i think about times when white people have been sincerely and greatly pained and it's been demonstrated to me it seemed white people were sincerely and greatly pained mm-hmm. about pearl harbor it seemed a number of white a significant number of white people were sincerely mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. greatly pained about 9-11 I have seen how white people respond when they are sincerely and greatly paid, like a significant number of white people. I have seen how they respond. I have never seen a response like that to racism. So when I hear a white person, an informed yeah. South Carolina native white person like yourself, <laughs> who's very informed about Ben Tillman, it's very hard for me to listen to you tell me that you think a significant number of white people are sincerely and greatly pained about racism and think that you're being truthful with me. Does that make sense? What I'm saying, professor Willimon? I think that that's a, that's a good point. And I, I think it's great. Uh, you, uh, calling that out. Uh, and I, 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 I agree. I, in the book, I note like among preachers for what that's worth, uh, among white preachers, they are 30% more likely to talk about hunger, world hunger, than they are by race in sermons uh, from national surveys. So that I think what you say is like, true. Exactly. So I just want to point that out for listeners. Yeah. I want to get to my next question, but I just want to point that out. I suspect that you could yeah. have been deliberately practicing white supremacy right there, Professor Willimon. That's what I mean. Just being truthful when we talk about these issues. That's what, if, if we're being trying to get white people to solve this yeah. problem, allegedly, <laughs> then let's be honest about this. Next question. Uh, yeah. Uh, do you you're, think, hang, you're on, also hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on one second. One way to be truthful is to have a conversation where a person of color can call you out and say, wait a minute, uh, this, this doesn't add up. Okay, well, I and, have a question uh, that I do want to get to. We can <laughs> get that in as we go, but I, yeah. but I would appreciate getting as many questions in and get to the book as well. So the next question, uh, and even for listeners who might be saying, well, wow, why, was, why is Gus talking to Professor Willimon like that? He's been gracious enough to come on and talk about his book. Just, <laughs> I think this is important. Do you think that it's logical Absolutely. for any non-white person in the world to be suspicious of any white person, including yourself, as long as the system of racism exists? Do you think that's logical? Absolutely. I think that's essential. And I think it's, but, and part of that is that that, uh, to be white is to often be uh, uh, blind and uh, to your own caughtness in this system. I must say, since you mentioned South Carolina, you know, being a South Carolina bred white person, uh, I've often thought it uh, almost a gift <laughs> to to have this deep sense of my own caughtness and fallenness and to not be surprised when I'm called out, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, yeah, I'm, I can say more about that, but yeah. Right on. It might happen as we proceed with the conversation. Uh, has a, Great. Has, has, a, uh, has a non-white person or even another white person ever accused you of doing something, saying something racist? 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, can you share mm-hmm. one of those times when you've been accused of doing something racist? <laughs> Well, I record about a courageous uh, 16-year-old whom I roomed with at a church conference who spent most of the night saying to me things like, does it bother you to get on Greenville City bus? And it says colored patrons sit from the rear, white patrons sit from the front, South Carolina law. And I said, gosh, I never thought about it. And he said, does it bother you that you never thought about it and consider that normal? And um, I, I put that down as maybe the closest thing I've ever come to a born again religious conversion experience. Um, but that also prepared me for a lifetime of people saying, uh, as a student said to me the other day, um, uh, uh, well, I can think of one particular moment that came across this way is uh, the day after the election, presidential election. I was walking down the hall, I passed an African-American student who's a uh, guy in my, one of my classes, and he said, how you doing? And I said, well, not so good. I'm, I'm uh, really, and he said, oh, are you sick? And I said, well, yeah, sort of. I mean, after the election. And then he said to me, you know, Dr. Woman, you, you just taught me a little bit. And I said, have I disappointed you today? And he said, so you're depressed and you're shocked that America has elected a lying white racist fool to be president. Huh. So this is your first time with that. <laughs> and I said to him, you know, God has sent you to me to, <laughs> to help me see how, um, in fact, so for one moment, for one brief shining moment, I, I got to see like, the election from the eyes of this young African American man. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, wanna, I thought, I hang on right huh. there. I, I just want to hang on <laughs> there because that sounds very familiar to me. Uh, where again, white people are not informed about racism, and uh, I, I just, yeah. I do not think that that is accurate at all. And I push back against that every time that I that I hear it. But you did answer my question about being suspicious. You said, in fact, that it's essential uh, that white people, or excuse me, that non-white people, victims of racism, be suspicious of white people like yourself, even including yourself, as yeah. long as the system exists. Uh, can Absolutely. can you talk about? Because you said you're. South Carolina native. You talk about that in the book. Uh, you talked about that in the previous interview, in fact, and growing up in this climate where you never even heard about uh, Willie Earl in this 1947 lynching. Mm-hmm. Can you talk about mm-hmm. how you were trained to practice racism and specifically because you mentioned racist jokes? If you could recount some of the racist jokes that you heard growing up, we would be super appreciative. Oh, oh gee. Um, I. I uh, I guess it's been a long time since anybody's told me a racist joke and probably part of my growing, um, you know, uh, oh, gee. I, I, I must say that I think uh, racial white supremacy uh, in 1950s, 60s Greenville was so thorough and complete that it's almost like uh, one didn't have to think about it. I mean, it was one one didn't think about it, but it was uh, so jokes, uh, ridiculing, uh, portraying uh, African Americans as stupid or uh, naive, or uh, you know, I, there were many. I'm 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 kind of blanking, and maybe I'm intentionally blanking, but I I uh, I do. I think the things that caused me to cringe as much as anything are the fact that how little um, this this was mentioned, that, that we lived in a racially segregated uh, society uh, where it, it, it was a it was a it was a police state. I mean, in every facet from church, school, home. Uh, every sports, everything combined with that. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I would, I would think I probably got worse indications than racial jokes. I mean, the fact that Strom Thurmond was an admired politician from South Carolina, 
And yet, uh, I remember when I was in college, uh, it was rumored that he had a black child. And so this was sort of, must have been common knowledge in South Carolina. And yet it was, it was part of the whole world view and, uh, and thorough. And I can imagine as a person of color, it's, you know, it's hard to understand uh, how there could be this sort of uniform across the board racism and yet uh, everything, law, school, courts, everything, as the Willie Earl case shows, uh, it all conspired together. Hmm. That, I appreciate the uh, the detail there, but man, you can't, I mean, if uh, you're growing up in Strom Thurmond's, South Carolina, in the 1950s, you had to hear, like, racist jokes about black people all the time. Are you telling me you can't recall one racist joke? Uh, <laughs> oh, gee, let me... Uh, I, 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 uh, gee, uh, and I mean, the, the fact that if I can't recall it, it may be part of my own kind of denial or, uh, unconscious. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to think, uh, oh, I remember, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, college, I went to Walford College, and I remember our freshman year, a, a cartoon in the journal um, where uh, a salesperson in the cartoon is saying, well, this is a new Martin Luther King doll. You wind it up, and it sits down. And that's what they do. And uh, I remember that in a college literary magazine my sophomore year. And that is the kind of humor that was there uh so hmm. I, I guess too it seemed like there was just as many bad things that don't seem to me now yeah I, anyway i'm i am having trouble remembering <laughs> hmm. that that has uh, been a pattern amongst uh, our white guests on the program where people people many people like yourself we've had older white people younger white people who've yeah. grown up you know in all all parts of the world where they've said oh man i heard racist jokes all the time we've had people who literally said i heard yeah. probably like yourself who could truthfully say i've heard thousands of them uh, in my uh, life and they yeah. couldn't remember one to tell us uh, that right <laughs> that, there stands out that as, is interesting and, and sometimes, I can remember, go ahead, go ahead. You know, I said, I can remember lots of incidents where my racism was exposed um, and I was caught. I must say, usually by someone of color uh, who cared enough to confront me or point it out or, or say it. Uh, I'm, I'm having trouble thinking. I, I don't remember like sitting around with people telling racist jokes. I guess my, I would say though, though, the, the system was so complete. It, 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 I don't know. It, it, it seemed like the jokes were the, among the least of the evils, uh, that we were part of. I, I would agree that that is true, particularly in the context of events like the lynching of Willie Earl. However, I think that the racist jokes are, ext they are essential. They are critical because frequently mm -hmm. when white people talk, they are not being truthful as it relates to matters about racism. In my view, racist yeah. jokes, that is one of the few times when you will hear white people speak honestly about what they think about black people. Uh, That's even, an interesting point. Yeah. Well, I, to get yeah. to your point, why did you write this book? And it might even speak to why so many white people have a difficult time remembering these jokes on this program in this context. Even white people <laughs> who said that they have heard thousands of them, like yeah. Professor Willimon. Hang, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. My question, yeah. my question, why did you write the book, uh, Who Killed Willie Earl, which came out just this year? Why did you write this book and who was your intended audience? <sighs> Well, I, you know, I, I I think it was partly personal. I began very personally saying how 
I had to wait uh, nearly 20 years to even hear the story. Uh, I remember when I went to the Greenville County Library uh, to do, as a college student, wanting to find out more about this, I asked the librarian, I said, do you have a file on the Willie Earl trial and lynching? And she said, just a moment. And so she comes back a few minutes later and she said, why do you want the file? <laughs> and I said, just curious. Uh, and she said, well, all right, you sit in here and look at it. And in the file, it had uh, the piece from the New Yorker magazine, Opera and Greenville. It had uh, copies of Greenville News. I read about people whom I knew, their children, at least didn't know them, uh, who participated in all this. And um, that began a kind of uh, a lifetime interest. And I guess I always had there that one day I wanted to write about it and to kind of give testimony about my own confrontation with that, that this happened in my hometown and all. And um, so the book really, I, I, I wanted to do a kind of historical reconstruction of a sermon that was preached uh, by a white preacher in the little town where Willie Earl was taken from the jail and lynched. I wanted to write about, uh, I started out thinking about it. I'd like to do a kind of construction about Holly Lynn, was the minister's name, and his sermon. Um, eventually decided to make that just the first third of the book, and then to talk about uh, to write a book that would encourage my fellow white preachers preaching to mostly white congregations to speak up and speak out about race. So, so is this? So that was my motivation. So it sounds like is your intended audience uh, specifically white Christians? Is that like your target audience? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, for, I mean, I am a white Christian, and um, I I felt like the predominantly white Christian church has got some confessing to do. It's got some confrontation with truth to do. And also uh, uh, the, the catalyst for writing the book finally was uh, after the Charleston massacre at Mother Emanuel. Uh, I just wrote about a dozen of my former students, white students serving churches in South Carolina, and I asked them, did you preach? Uh, did you mention the massacre in your sermon Sunday? I wish you'd send me a copy of what you said. And I'm pleased to say all of them, uh, in various ways, found a way to say something about uh, this uh, horror that occurred, this mass shooting. And uh, that, so I thought, uh, gee, what? Can I do something that would encourage preachers to speak up and speak out? And I include portions of some of those sermons in the book, uh, I hope is encouragement. Uh, as I note in the book, white people get really nervous uh, with, with talk about race. And they're powerful forces to keep this talk from occurring. Mm. I think in my view, I think uh, it's most accurate why people get nervous about being accused uh, and discovered as being racist, uh, talking about racist mm -hmm. evidence of the racist jokes. Uh, you can just look online for racist jokes, nigger jokes. And I mean, you will see tens of thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of pages and pages and pages uh, endlessly. Yeah. White people have no problem talking about white people when it's just white people. Uh, they have a problem when they could be publicly identified as a racist. Uh, and I do want to emphasize this for listeners, because that was the conclusion I came to reading your book, that this was probably your target audience is white people, quote unquote, white Christians. This is not a book that I mm -hmm. would recommend uh, for black people to read. This is not a book I would recommend for black people if you want to learn uh, about who lynched Willie Earl, because a lot of this is focused on this uh, white preacher, uh, Mr. Howley, uh, that, I mean, if you want to learn more about Willie Earl, uh, this is not the book for you. So I would not encourage this book for uh, our black. Yeah. And I, uh, I would say uh, uh, a guy who's a friend of mine, who's given his life to the trial, the lynching, um, Will Gravely, his book, The Definitive History, will come out, uh, 
next year, University of South Carolina Press. And it tells the whole sort of story. What's his name uh, he's, again? He's a white historian. Will, uh, Graf- Will Gravely. Gravely. G-R-A-V-E-L-E-Y. Uh, and uh, he has been a long time uh, uh, worker in civil rights and all. Uh, but uh, his book really, uh, he he has done a mountain of work, uh, interviewed with Earl's mother, uh, got the last interview with her, uh, uh, tracked down everybody who had talked to him. And so you're right. Uh, this, this book is really addressed to my fellow preachers okay. and trying to instigate this conversation. Have you seen any evidence? And this is a very important question uh, to make sure that we get answered. Um, have you okay. seen Have you seen any evidence that white people collectively are going to voluntarily stop practicing white supremacy? Oh, ooh, voluntarily! You added voluntarily there. I would. Uh, no, I have not seen much evidence of that, and of course. Our conversation occurs after this public display in November, uh, where once again we showed we are not willing to come to terms with truth uh, about ourselves and our history. Um, I must say, though, as a preacher, you know, hey, uh, if racism. I would think from a Christian point of view, is a sin, an evil, uh, an offense against God. Uh, I say to my fellow preachers, uh, you know, I don't expect people voluntarily, you know, to do anything. But I do believe God is able to work transformation in people's lives. And I've I've seen that. And uh, some of the sermons I use... uh, in fact, many of them, one way or another, are testimonials by white preachers about some really rather impressive transformations that have occurred in their own lives uh, on this. Uh, mm. But I don't believe any of them changed voluntarily. Yeah, mm. I, I know I did. I see, and these, and and even I guess we we could go right there with you uh, because you just said you know, some of this, some of these, uh, testimonies, some of the testimonies that you've got from other, uh, practicing quote unquote white Christians has been impressive. Their transformations, uh, in terms of getting a better understanding of racism, that is not impressive to me at all. Uh, a white person saying that, uh, we still have a system of white supremacy, uh, and you cite the statistics, you know them well, uh, you're very informed, uh, citing Michelle Alexander and just going down the line, ta Coates and all of this about how bad things are in all mm-hmm. areas of people activity and this is worldwide, that being transformed where that's not the case anymore, that would be impressive. A white person just talking and running off at the mouth about how they don't use the word nigger anymore, that does not impress me at all. Uh, And I would go specifically with you. You use the term in the book recovering racist, which I think is another way that white people practice racism. Uh, Is it accurate? Would it be truthful to to say that on this date, May 30th, 2017, you, Professor William Willimon, who actually, I think, had a distant ancestor who was involved in this uh, lynching of Willie Earl. Is it accurate to say that you on this I day? my name. Ac- yeah. Absolutely. You mentioned that in the book. Is it accurate yeah. to say that you are a racist? Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. And that, I'm, I'm, hang on I'm, one I'm second. Hang on one second. Hang on one second. Because yeah. all of that, <laughs> that does not impress me. And that just, it dilutes the admission that is important uh, that after all these buckets of words and we pray and we've written all these books, you are still a racist. That should be the lead. In fact, and particularly with black people, because it's been my experience, many black people, we do not have an accurate understanding. It's been my experience that many black people. In fact, let me ask when you did uh, when you did this book, did you have any contact with any of uh, Willie Earl's family or did you did you not speak with any of them? I, I did, uh, you know, uh, uh, actually a, a, a grand niece, uh, yeah, and 
when we had our day at Walford College, we had a great, uh, I thought, uh, representation uh, from, you know, kind of who's still around of the family, uh, and also others who had some fascinating linkages, uh, you know, with it. Yeah. Okay. But that, that's one thing I criticize the white preacher for is that there was a, just a total absence of attempt to contact the family, to have any interaction, to have even have interaction with the, the clergy who uh, had the funeral and the burial. And uh, that, yeah. Did any so, of did any of the family members essential. did any of the family members that you spoke with did they suspect you of being racist did they call you out on any of your behaviors while you were <laughs> you know I don't know uh, I I tell you though you know an old white guy writing a book on race <laughs> I'm nervous and 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 I fully expect uh, to be called out one of my colleagues Christina Cleveland I don't. Uh, oh wait a minute! Because we deviated. African. Did did the family did did, well, did any of them call you out? No, did, no. Did, did they anybody? No, they were artic- all, you know, I they, think were they were all very generous to me. That's yeah. <laughs> that's what I mean. And and you're not just a white man, yeah. an old white guy writing a book. You are a white preacher coming to write a book. Isn't that true? Right. Okay. Yeah. And that is extremely significant because I think they might look at you a little differently as, oh, this is a white preacher coming to, you know, talk to us about this, this lynching that happened before, as opposed to this is just some, yeah. what, absolutely, that's what I mean, could be practicing racism. <laughs> They're leaving out that detail. Uh, but I just, I, it's been my experience that victims of racism, black people, we, one of the major problems we do not understand even the, the white people that seem like they're great and seem like they're cool and are writing these books and are willing to come talk to us and have a snack with us and talk nice to us and don't tell any racist jokes. Uh, even those white people are racist and you should be suspicious of them. Even the Professor Willimons. Yes, racist. You should be suspicious yeah. of them. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, continuing. Uh, I wanted to... Uh, I, Apologies to listeners because I'm trying to do a lot of things with this. Uh, for the folks who are not informed about the 1947 lynching of Willie Earl, I know you said that uh, Mr. Gravely's book is coming out later. If you could give kind of the short synopsis of this revolt amongst these white cab drivers in South Carolina where they get upset and this lynching occurred, can you kind of give the, the short kind of synopsis of these events? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, basically, a, a, a white cab driver, Tom Watson, was found bleeding, uh, dying, as it turned out, on the side of the road uh, outside of uh, Pickens, South Carolina. And uh, his kind of last words for passing out was, he said, a, a, a large Negro did this to me and stole my money. Uh, they, uh, I've forgotten the details, but Somehow the police got to Willie Earl, who was uh, had been in Pickens visiting his mother from Greenville, and uh, the cab driver claimed that he was taking uh, this man from Greenville to Pickens uh, on a Saturday night. Uh, Willie Earl was arrested. He was never charged. Uh, he was awaiting being charged and put in the Pickens County Jail. That night, a group of cab drivers uh, got together, formed a mob. They were going to avenge their friend's death, and they drove in a caravan over to Pickens County Jail. They uh, awoke the jailer. Uh, They took Willie Earl with absolutely no resistance from the jailer, the aged jailer. Uh, The sheriff lived like two blocks away from the jail, and he was never called or anything, and they took Willie Earl out. They got him to the Greenville Pickens County line, and they tortured him to death, uh, and then they called the black undertaker in Greenville and said there's a body out on Bramlett Road. And uh, then the next day when word of this got out, uh, the New Deal governor, Strom Thurmond, said... Uh, uh, this is horrible. We're going to bring the people who did this to justice. Uh, and it was condemned in the papers. Interestingly, in the Greenville News, the lynching was condemned and said the worst thing about the lynching is now our northern critics are going to tell us how to run things in the south. 
now that our marvelous history of our 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 marvelous record of race racial harmony has been damaged. Uh, so somehow they managed to portray the, themselves as victims uh, in the Greenville News. Uh, but a couple months later, uh, and the FBI got involved, confessions were taken from all but three, I think, of the lynchers, signed confessions. They bragged about this. Uh, uh, many of them did. And uh, a, a trial was held. And uh, the trial attracted international attention because we had just fought a war against the Nazis, and now this sort of violence occurring in the United States. And uh, all of them were acquitted. And uh, 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 the narrative in Greenville was that you had these white, poor, poorly educated mill hicks that were the cab drivers, and they did this, but this is not typical of white people in Greenville. Um, I heard that narrative uh, countless times growing up in Greenville, that we wouldn't have a race problem, it's just these ignorant whites. Well, that was put to lie in the trial, where <laughs> uh, Ivy League educated lawyers basically produced acquittals uh, for all of these uh, confessed killers. And... Um, and there it lay uh, until uh, Will Gravely and formed a, a citizens committee. Uh, some years later, Will's been a long time professor at the University of Denver. And markers were put up uh, where Willie Earl was killed, and also a marker was put up where the trial was held at the Greenville County Courthouse. Um, that marker, the marker where he was killed, was stolen. And it's never been recovered. Wow! What year was it stolen? So, do you know what year it was stolen, or about? It was stolen. It was stolen a year after it was put up, and I'm guessing it was about six years ago. A group of students at Walford College is raising money to have the marker put back. Wow! <laughs> they they avowed if it's stolen again, but I think that is a, a kind of metaphor for we we just really wish this were not the true history. Yeah. That, to me, stands out a lot in terms of, number one, the tackiness of it. Uh, but I see that <laughs> pattern uh, repeated. Oh, ooh, I thought that laughter. was a southern word, tacky. Yeah, okay. uh, I think a lot yeah. of people say tacky. A lot of our listeners, use we use it all the time. <laughs> oh, and okay. But at any rate, uh, the tackiness of it yeah. all. And then that yeah. pattern is repeated consistently, and it's worldwide. We had Doreen Lawrence on the program, who's a black yeah. mother in mm. England, and her son was killed by a similar mob of white thug racists who killed her son for no reason. They just saw a black teenager on the street and stabbed him, left him to die in the gutter, mm. literally, in <clears> London. This is 1993, not ancient history. They killed him. Nobody was prosecuted for 20 years. They built, they put a plaque on the spot where he died, and his mom came on this program and testified that white racists, they go and they smear paint on it and trash and dog poo. They do this regularly wow. uh, where they have to go and clean wow. it and all that. And they have a physical monument, like a building that is uh, in honor to his legacy and trying to help address racism. She said racists come and break the windows all the time and write racist graffiti all on it. I've heard the same thing oh. with the casket of Emmett Till here. And even for you to sigh like that, you have to know this is very, very common uh, in terms of racist white behavior. He, yeah. I mean, you talk about in the book, they mutilated uh, Willie Earl's body uh, before they killed him. We can't mm -hmm. just kill a nigger. We got to torture him. Uh, my question I was going to ask before I get to the book, number one, even before I get to uh, the, the focus of the book, or kind of the focus of the book, uh, Mr. Hawley, uh, being someone who grew up in South Carolina, have you heard white... Hawley Lynn, yeah. Hawley Lynn, yes, sir. Have you heard uh, yeah. whites use the term... Nigra, not Negro, Nigra. Have you heard whites say it that way? I have, uh, growing up. Uh, I think I said in the book, I don't, I don't know if I said, I didn't say this in the book, but uh, my family like to consider themselves sort of uh, landed gentry. And uh, I was instructed, I can't remember being instructed, but maybe it didn't, that uh, we sort of certified our landed gentry status by uh, using the term uh, uh, 
Negro, or the, the earlier term was colored, mm. and that was considered a polite, genteel uh, expression. And uh, so, yeah, I've, I've heard that, and uh, I've even heard, growing up, you know, efforts to stratify African Americans as uh, saying, I, he is just kind of a field uh, darkie. And, uh, but now she is a Negro, uh, 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 but they are a wonderful colored family. I remember those expressions. Um, uh, one thing about race, it, 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 it's hard for me to know kind of where things begin and end, but, uh, class mixed up with it, like the cab drivers, for instance, um, uh, there is, I'm sure as you know, I mean, a long record of, uh, of, of class resentment being mixed. The way I experienced it growing up as a teenager in Greenville was um, the textile mills were all uh, non-union, and the textile mills were reserved for whites, for poor whites, many of whom came from the mountains and the fields and worked in the textile mills for terrible conditions and poor wages. Whenever they talk about organizing, the response was, uh, well, well, we'll just call in the coloreds. Uh, they'd love to have these jobs. And that was the end of that. And so there's a long history of playing off the poor uh, against one another. I mean, I think we saw it again in the recent election. Oh, I want to uh, pop in because we did deviate a little bit. I do just want to say that okay. whenever I hear that yeah, from I'm white sorry. people, I'm very no apologies, but just I'm very suspicious. Uh, whenever white people talk about class, I, I remind our listeners consistently the position I've taken. There is white people constitute a class to themselves. Even if you are a poor white person, you're still not a nigra, nigger, negro, yeah. colored. Even yeah. if you are a yeah. poor white person with one tooth and one nickel. Uh, the question that I was going to ask, uh, even uh, by the way, I want to affirm your suspicion. I, I just I, I like your suspicion. You're wise. <clears throat> right on. My question, uh, even <laughs> Professor Howley Lynn, or excuse me, I'm sorry, preacher, uh, the preacher that you yeah. talk about in the book, yeah. preacher uh, Howley Lynn, white preacher yeah. Howley Lynn. Yeah. Uh, even he accepted that Willie Earl, Willie Earl was a murderer and a fiend. And, you know, it's it's terrible what he did. Even he accepted that Willie Earl did this crime. And you write in the book that, you know, well, wait a minute. Now, the evidence might even suggest that he might not have even done this crime. But that just kind of yeah. got pitched to the side, even for people who were saying that this lynching was bad. Uh, can you address that point? Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, I confess in the book, uh, as did I. I, I just always assume uh, Willie Earl uh, committed this stabbing. Uh, and, uh, but when I read Will Gravely's, uh, material, uh, the, the evidence against Willie Earl didn't add up. Uh, for one thing, his wallet was empty when he was arrested or had a couple of dollars in it. He could have never afforded the cab fare from Greenville to Pickens, et cetera. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, in fact, I criticize Holly's sermon. Holly does get into race and segregation as an evil, uh, which was kind of impressive for a white preacher in South Carolina in 1947. However, the sermon is basically saying that this lynching is an affront to American democracy. And the sermon is kind of a civic lesson on the noble roots of democracy, and we've just fought a war over this, and uh, incidents like this are a betrayal of the American character. There's no real sense in his sermon, no, this is America. I mean, this, this is the American character. This is what white people in America do uh, to keep uh, African Americans uh, subservient. Uh, so uh, that, that interested me. It, Holly may have preach that because he may have thought that would give him his best hearing that here, you know, in the post-war and all. Uh, however, I, I do think it sad that he didn't seem to understand that, uh, no, this is, this is white supremacy in action. And, uh, so. Hmm. 
I'm going to come back to uh, Holly Lynn. I just wanted to get uh, get you get your response. This is a paragraph uh, in the article "Opera in Greenville," uh, which you reference in the text. Uh, this was written mm-hmm. by Rebecca West. This is a white English woman uh, who came over here from the UK uh, in 1947 to cover yeah. the trial for the New Yorker, and she wrote this uh, really deep. I mean thorough, thorough piece where she kind of gives a minute by minute description of her observations and what have you. She has a fascinating uh, portion in the piece uh, where she's writing and she's talking about, you know, I guess she did different interviews with black people, white people at the time in terms of what they thought about the trial and the verdict and everything. And so she says that one of the odd interviews or responses that she got came from a black person. I just want to read this and and get your response about how the system of white supremacy uh, impacts really corrupts the thinking of black people. Uh, So she says that uh, one of the odd responses she got came uh, from her stay in Greenville came from a Negro uh, and his plea, oddly enough, was a plea for the extension of the Jim Crow system. And so these are all in, this is all in quotes. There is nothing I wish for more, he said, than a law that would prohibit Negroes from riding in taxi cabs driven by white men. They love to do it. We all love to do it. Can't you guess why? Because it is the only time we can pay a white man to act as a servant to us. And that does something to me. Even though I can check up on myself and see what's happening, I say to myself, this is fine. I'm hiring this white man. He's doing a chore for me. He threw his head back and breathed deeply and patted his chest to show how he felt. If riding in a white taxi cab does this to me, what do you think it does to Negroes who haven't been raised right or are full of liquor? Then queer things happen. Mighty queer things. Killing is one of them. It is apparently the practice in many southern towns, such as Savannah, that whites use only taxis with white drivers and Negroes use only taxis with Negro drivers. Again, this is Rebecca West from Opera in Greenville, 1947. Uh, What are your thoughts about this passage? Uh, Well, you know, I don't doubt uh, that uh, she found somebody... And I, it it does. I, I got to confess that that passage did not jump out at me in reading over Rebecca West. I I felt like Rebecca West got a little. She got conned uh, in a way by the white power structure uh, in her article. But um, yeah, I I remember. Uh, I, I would bet in in uh, the context of racial uh, legal racism legal white supremacy, I, I could imagine somebody would feel that way. And that does remind me that taxi was a big deal. In fact, uh, I note uh, that after the Willie Earl trial, uh, which was became kind of a double tragedy, uh, there was a boycott of the cab companies by African Americans in Greenville. And the boycott must have been amazingly effective because... <laughs> The cab companies are advertising the Greenville News that they would take African Americans to church for free. I highlighted that. I thought that was profound. I thought that was such an amazing uh, bit of black self-respect, which I would have appreciated more detail that on that as opposed to preacher Holly Lynch. Like that does not really impress yeah. me. Uh, a white preacher going to well, talk to you're his... not a preacher, and <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I'm not white. Yeah, but I, I, I'm not a racist. Uh, I'm a victim of white supremacy. So hearing a white person, and even yeah. Holly Lynn, I still suspect that he's a racist. If I was talking to him, I would talk to him the same way that I'm talking to you. Even that, that does not impress yeah. me. Uh, and I would double yeah. down on it because a lot of times there is a white savior syndrome. There is a tendency to worship John Brown's yeah. uh, and the two yeah. white boys who died with James Cheney in 1964. And I say it that way, yeah. deliberately yeah. not naming them. There's a tendency to worship these individuals and to totally ignore legions of black people who have done the exact same thing or more. Yeah. They just get totally ignored. And uh, preacher Holly Lynn you said nothing happened to him. He didn't lose his job. Like he didn't get thrown in jail and no. didn't, he didn't get a sad. He yeah. said he didn't remember one bad response after he got up and did this sermon. So, I mean, whoop de doo I would have much rather heard and, about the black uh, people, how they organized. You know, uh, we tried, I mean, Will Gravely and I have tried to get, we wondered 
what African American preachers were preaching uh, that week, uh, that month, that time. Unfortunately, we were unsuccessful in finding such sermons. Of course, you know, uh, existent printed sermons are not all are, are fairly rare anyway. But uh, one thing that was a revelation to me was the African American press uh, during this period. Uh, sadly, so many, so many, so much of the production of the African American press has been lost. But uh, the Amsterdam, I mean, a lot of uh, African American newspapers, I mean, they covered this carefully and they knew exactly what was going on. And they, uh, as you say, that testimonial is sadly uh, lacking. Uh, knowledge of that, those testimonials. And uh, I, I thought it was kind of amazing that uh, Holly Lynn didn't make any contact with the, the, the preacher in town. Uh, he had a public meeting uh, that I recount, and yet it was an all-white public meeting. And basically the purpose of the public meeting was to say, this wasn't Pickens, uh, this, we're better than this. Uh, you know, this wasn't typical of us. I did think one positive thing of Holly's sermon was he said, no, uh, who lynched Willie Earl? We did. <laughs> and so. Mm. That public I, meeting that you reference in the book was broken up by whites who came in and bragged about the lynching and said that that is right. exactly what should have happened, and the meeting was dispersed, and that was that, which I think is also, uh, which is mm -hmm. exactly why I come back to the point. I've just seen no evidence that whites are going to voluntarily discontinue uh, the practice of racism, white supremacy. Uh, and I did want to get back to, before I get uh, some of the listeners who dialed in who have a question that they would like to ask uh, Professor William Willimon, I did want to ask about Strom Thurmond, because uh, I do think very important former governor of South Carolina, uh, someone who was, uh, I, I think it's accurate, it's historically correct, someone who is a proud, unabashed white supremacist. Uh, he was one of the co-authors of the massive resistance effort after the Brown versus Board of Education uh, decision, uh, where whites across the South uh -huh. uh, said, you know, we are absolutely not going to have these, you know, nigger children uh, in school with our little white boys and girls, uh, and we're going to do everything that we can in opposition to the Supreme Court and anybody else uh, who tries to, you know, tell us how to run our our schools and treat our niggers. Uh, he was one of the, the staunch uh, fourth, most forthright members of that group, the massive resistance effort. Um, just yeah. like, a, and he also has a statue that did not get removed after Dylan Storm Roof's terrorist attack. Uh, after all of the things that Strom Thurmond did publicly broadcast, famously uh, famous filibusters against efforts in Congress uh, to support civil rights for black people. After everything that he did as governor of South Carolina, ultimately a U.S. Senator as well, after all of the things and talking that he did against black people, and you already talked about it, him engaging in sexual intercourse with a black female. Uh, and even just to put detail and context on that, I think she was uh, under the age of 16 at the time. I think she worked in uh, his house. I think it was uh, the help type yeah, scenario, put that right. in quotes. And I do yeah. think it would be considered uh, child rape. I think that's what it would be considered. Yeah. I think he was over 21. She was under 16. That's the proper way that it should be discussed, not some sort of romantic mm -hmm. uh, union or what have you, but total rape and exploitation of, of a child. Um, what are your, because that seems to be a major pattern. We've had a lot of programs where we've talked about this. White people, even explicitly, boldly, flagrantly white supremacist whites, still having sexual intercourse with black people. What do, what do you make of that behavior pattern amongst whites? Oh, uh, uh, well, I, you know, it's, it has a long history, uh, Jefferson, et cetera. It is real. Uh, to, to me, it's, it's just all of a piece of, of the kind of many tentacled racist evil that uh, uh, the amount of self-deceit, the amount of social deceit, the preying on the vulnerable, the keeping people in subjugation through the weapon of uh, sexual violence. I, I, yeah, I, I don't, I'm no expert on it <laughs> uh, looking at it, but I know it's, it's part of the whole picture. And as you said, it's, yeah, it's odd as 
being whites talking about protecting our women and keeping separate. And of course, this is so tied into lynching and all. Uh, it's it, it, and as you say, uh, still having this uh, racial interaction. So, yeah, sexual exploitation. Sexual exploitation. Yeah. Um, do. You, well, and, and sex is a kind of a weapon of uh, keeping people quiet and uh, uh, keeping people down. And, I mean, white supremacy is a mini tentacled thing. <laughs> mm. On this program, uh, one of the ways that I have suggested for years that non-white people, one of the things that we can do to help work against racism uh, is not engaging in any sort of sexual activity with white people as long as the system of white supremacy exists uh, for some of those exact mm. uh, reasons that you do have a lot of mm -hmm. Strom Thurmonds. You have a lot of racists uh, who are devoted, diehard, staunchly committed to the system of white supremacy, but they enjoy the power. They enjoy weaponizing sex and taking advantage of non-white people who are in a mm -hmm. weaker position. There's a lot of that. It's demonstrated throughout history. You mentioned Thomas Jefferson, myriad of others. Uh, it would cut that out. And every single white person who is engaged in participating in the system of racism, white supremacy, None of that should be happening until justice has been established, until non-white people are not being mistreated. We should not be engaged in any sort of bedroom activity until these problems have been permanently resolved. Does that make accurate sense, kind of thinking of Strom Thurmond's conduct, putting this well, in context? Well, yeah, I, I, I think it's fascinating. Um, I, I, I don't know, it's up for me to say that makes sense. I mean, I, I, just, I, I must say I really... One thing in doing this book kind of forced me to do what I should have done more of, and that is to uh, really get into the literature. Uh, I think um, my book has got excessive footnotes in a way, but in like 80, 90 percent of the footnotes are of African-American scholars and researchers. I think uh, one weapon against uh, white supremacy is, is the amazing amount of sociological analysis, historical reconstruction and remembrance, theological reflection, friends of mine like uh, Willie Jennings and Jake Cameron Carter. Uh, I really think this kind of demonic force is not go. maybe this is your point, is not going to be driven out by uh, sincere white people working on this. I, I love the fact that African Americans are doing the work to expose, to remember, to show. So, deviated from the sex, uh, the question about uh, non-white people I, not I'm engaging a preacher. in sex. I don't want to talk about people. sex. I have it here, come on. Well, that is in the Bible. Yeah. I think that sex is is included in the Bible. They talk about immaculate conception uh, and uh, rules. Well, for, no, I mean God invented it in in Genesis, male and yeah. Sex. That that okay. to me sounds like a white person practicing racism, white supremacy. Uh, we're not, you know, engaging in any sort of pornographic cheap talk here. We're not being tacky or lewd. Uh, in, oh, in fact, right. in fact. Have you engaged in sexual intercourse with a non-white person, Professor Willimon? Uh, no, no. Okay. <laughs> no, I haven't. Okay. I haven't. The important uh, question, given the context. Uh, but but I, I, see, I, I see your point. I mean, I, I see a point there. But I, I think, uh, and again, uh, here in this brief conversation, uh, you're uncovering racism in me that I thought I had, uh, you know, overcome. But maybe that's that's a very typical kind of American kind of uh, fantasy. White you know, fantasy. On my part. White fantasy. Yeah. White fantasy. Yeah. <laughs> Importance of words. And, and God has called you to confront the fantasy. That was good for you. That's good. Hmm. Context of white supremacy. Again, our guest, Professor uh, William Willimon, admitted <laughs> racist uh the folks that dialed in that <laughs> have a question uh thomas in new york did you have a question for uh, professor willimon thomas in new york did you have a question can you hear me Gus? yes sir yeah good evening Gus. good evening professor willimon 
Now, I had a couple of questions for you. Um, first question being, um, do you think it's logical? And um, just for context, um, uh, you are familiar with the time of history called um, slavery. The black people were enslaved by whites um, uh -huh. a lot in your state. Um, and um, we were forced to become Christians. And um, on up to Dylan Wolf going into a black Christian church and shooting nine people. Do you think it's logical for blacks to still be Christians in 2017? You know, it's not for me to tell uh, black Christians to not be Christian or be Christian. I, I guess I do think it's amazing that, uh, as you say, the, the history of uh, African uh, was slavery and conversion and all. I think it's amazing that African Americans took the Christian, received the Christian faith from uh, their white masters in the South, at least, and um, and they they said we reject your racism and your white supremacy, but we accept Jesus and we. Uh, have found down through the generations, African American Christians have found hope and strength and the will to resist uh, in the Christian faith. Uh, I think it's amazing, and uh, I uh, so yeah. I, um, yes, but, no, and, and by the way, I've got yeah. I've got friends, um, African Americans, who say they they cannot be Christian because of the history, because of the uh, complicity, the injustice, and I can understand that. Uh, but I also have maybe more friends who say um, it's because of my Christianity that I can continue to struggle and I continue to resist the lies that are told about me and my race. Do you think it's safe to say that Jesus is a symbol of white supremacy? I think Jesus has been made into that. Uh, Jesus, uh, my colleague Christina Cleveland uh, wrote in Christianity Today about the brown-skinned Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, Jesus Christ it, it certainly uh, looks more like an African-American, then he looks like me. However, it's one of the many perversions of uh, white supremacy that Jesus Christ was attempted to be transformed into this white savior, uh, which is, you know, just one more of the perversions. Okay, are you all familiar with um, a North Carolina woman, woman who was hung last month? Or uh, um, they, they're you know, um, they're listing this as a suicide, but her name was Kendra Shanice Reed. Uh, in was it in a prison? Or I'm familiar with a young man who was it was listed as a suicide in Eastern North Carolina that is still a case still under some dispute, but I'm not familiar with that case. I'm sorry to say. Oh, okay. This, in this case in particular, there was a video that surfaced around the internet of a black woman being hung by men wearing um, Confederate flag shirts, and um, it was erroneously um, said that it was this lady. Um, I just want to know if that might have rung a bell. No, um, it doesn't. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Um, I, was my on, last, um, I was on my... Oh, yeah. Okay. No, you go ahead, sir. I'm sorry. No, I was on my way home from church <laughs> three weeks ago, and I drove past the older, the oldest uh, cemetery in Durham, uh, which was an all-white cemetery up till recent. I mean, up till the '60s. And I, you know, just had to look out of my car, and I saw dozens of Confederate flags on graves, and. Uh, I, I looked just as I was driving by and couldn't tell if they were on supposedly graves of Confederate veterans or what. Anyway, I uh, the next morning, I, I called and tried to find out uh, 
who was in charge of the cemetery. Anyway, uh, uh, two days later, they were all gone. But uh, I, I tell you, white supremacy is, I compare it to toxic waste. Uh, we, we bury it, we plow over it, and yet from time to time it bubbles right back up. Uh, I bet Gus would say, you know, it's, <laughs> it's constantly bubbling. It's not just incidental. But, uh, yeah, excuse me, you had another question. Gus would say that's a lot of metaphors. Oh, yeah, I, would, I would definitely right. agree that it, um, it's, it's continuous and consistent. Um, well, yeah. this yeah. is my last question is um, you, you used the word tacky earlier, and I, I consider it to be very tacky uh, when white people come on the show and, um, as Gus alluded to, um, say that they've heard racist jokes and they can't share any when it's, um, they're around black people. And you being a white Christian minister... I would really like for you to um, reconsider and um, at least share one of your racist jokes that you heard either in your family life or in your childhood life with the audience. And I'll meet my mind. Thank you, Gus. Uh, no, we, good. I'm, I'm still, yeah. I've, I just got to admit, um, and Gus would say this is my own continuing racism, but, uh, yeah, I hadn't, thank you all for, calling to my attention about uh, the jokes uh, and I'm going to do better. I'm going to remember some racist joke that I have suppressed. Yeah. Uh, other folks that uh, dialed in who have questions, make sure if they have the number, it's 641-715-3640 the code 564 nine four three pound press star six if you have a question for professor willimon uh we just want to get to call us who have questions really quick so we don't take up his whole evening uh the person uh dialed in uh first person i guess dialed in with a hand up i think this is retired firefighter did you have a question for professor willimon uh yes sir uh you uh, uh to the guest uh I heard you agreeing with Mr. Renegade's meaning of racism, white supremacy. And I also heard you use the phrase white Christian. My question to you is, is it logical to think under the global system of racism, white supremacy, that anyone is practicing and or preaching something called Christianity? It, it, I'm, I didn't, maybe I didn't hear that. Uh, is anyone, what was your question again, please? You mentioned yeah. the term white Christian, whatever the hell that means. I yeah. don't know what it means. And you also agreed with Mr. Renegade's definition of racism, white supremacy. In that context, can there be something called Christianity effectively preached and or worshipped and a global system of racism and white supremacy also at the same time? Oh, is I that think... logical? <sighs> no, it isn't logical. I mean, it, it's, I think, you know. Okay, you, you, don't, you, don't have to, you don't have to articulate on it. That, that's, that's all I want yeah. to know. Okay. My next question is, yeah. My next question is, is this, under the global system of racism, white supremacy, you have white people who practice racism and you have non-white people who are the victims. Who is the less confused about racism, and white supremacy? White people or, the, or their non-white victims? Less confused, uh, I would. Thing. About what it is, about what it is, and how it works specifically. I, I just wanted to be much more specific about what white supremacy is and how it works. Who's yeah. the most confused? I think, oh, I would think uh, the supremacist, uh, the white person. Uh, wow. One uh, is, the, is more confused, or maybe confused. I'd say in denial or uh, an active 
uh, resistance uh, uh, from the truth. Uh, part of being African American, I assume, in America is you got to get pretty savvy about white supremacy uh, to survive, to have your children survive. And uh, I think white people blissfully can go along thinking, oh, that's a problem that's been solved before, or that's other white people. Uh, other than me, so confused, I think is maybe putting it kindly. How is it, how can a person be a victim of something and be an expert in that same problem at the same time, sir? Uh, well, don't you think that the oppressed always know more than the oppressor, or they, they certainly understand the oppressor, Better than that, uh, sir. Sir, sir, I, I am the one. I'm the one who asking who's asking the questions. Uh, well, that's, I mean, that's, 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 that, that's a. I, I, I suspect right now that you are practicing racism by asking me that question in that context. The answer is no. Oh. Is lo I mean, logically speaking, uh, uh, and an understanding that uh, I think the exact opposite, and not because, not because it's just my opinion, because from a logical standpoint, and by you not, understand, by, by you not admitting this logical standpoint, it kind of tells me that you are practicing racism. Okay. Do you think I, that's uh, accurate? I'm, I, I was thinking I was agreeing with you, but uh, yeah, they, you didn't hear it that way. Well, wait, 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 maybe I need, maybe I need, maybe I missed something. I, I, I asked the question. Yeah. Under the global system of racial white supremacy, where yeah. there are white people who are practicing racism, yeah. non-white people can't practice racism. We are right. only the non-white people are the victims. How can a right. non-white person be an expert on racism, white supremacy, and a victim at the same time? That's a question. Well, I would think their victimization makes them painfully aware of things that the victimizer is not aware of. So they have a kind of hard-earned knowledge. But that may not so be what you, you are you, 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 you are saying that white people don't consciously practice racism. Is that correct? Uh, yes, they do, and they don't. I mean, they—it's much of it is unconscious. That doesn't make it right, but m much of it is conscious. Can you give me an example uh, of an unconscious racist? Well, like bias, bias against people. That's what, usually that unconscious. Bias, no, bias. Bias. Can you give yeah. Can you give me an example of of a bias, unconscious racist? Uh, well, the fact that when people are shown a, a picture of a neighborhood and uh, to a white person and they're all white people walking down the street and they say, would you like to live in this neighborhood? Fine. Then they're shown uh, another picture of the same neighborhood and they're African-Americans walking down the street. They say, no, that's not as nice a neighborhood. Uh, that's, to me, unconscious. And yet it's, it's, it's insidious, maybe more insidious because it's totally unthought out, and yet it is real. Hang on. One, bias. Hang on one second, retired firefighter. I'm trying to get uh, some of the other folks who dialed in. Uh, our lovely black mom <laughs> in Michigan, and I think you actually took her question, but, uh, or at least one of them. If you have other questions you want to ask, you should be with us, uh, black mom in Michigan. Good evening. Sorry guys. about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's all good. Thank you for asking the question. I do have another question um, to the guests. Uh, the first question is, um, well, Dylan Roof, uh, we know what, what he did, and a lot of the victims uh, have come out, uh, the family members of the victims have come out and uh, openly stated that they forgive him and uh, also professed being Christians. And so, I'm just wondering, what is your position on forgiveness? Uh, what do you think about them forgiving Dylan Roof? And um, as a Christian yourself, 
again, just kind of expound on what your position is on forgiveness. That's my first question. Oh, wow. Uh, big question, um, but, but appropriate. I, I think I, as a white person, I am really, I'm in awe if an African-American person can look upon uh, Dylan Roof and, uh, and say, I forgive. Uh, in one sense, I mean, that's sort of the summit of the Christian faith, to be able to do that. Jesus commands us, forgive your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, etc. Some of the more radical things Jesus said. Um, on the other hand, I don't want to, I'm uncomfortable by fellow white people who have said, uh, isn't this wonderful? And they showed uh, the forgiveness. I, I think the forgiveness is wonderful. But I'm, I don't know, I just, I think African-American Christians have had to forgive white people a lot. And I, I'm okay if that forgiveness is not swift in coming. I can understand that. And I think uh, it, it does sort of challenge me as a Christian. I have to ask myself, gosh, would I be capable of such forgiveness? And so it was a remarkable witness. On the other hand, it's a witness that I don't want white people to take any kind of false comfort in. Uh, does that make sense, or how would you challenge that? <laughs> um, I just kind of wanted to hear your response. That's sufficient, if that's your response. Um, my second question is, um, are, do you consider yourself a racist? You know, I do. I, I, I wanted to say to Gus, a recovering racist, Gus uh, chafed at that, uh, but I... I I, I, and maybe this is a bad analogy, but I, my analogy was alcoholism. Uh, I know people who are practicing alcoholics and are doing much damage to themselves and others. I know people who are recovering alcoholics, and that means that sometimes they're sober and then sometimes they're not, and it means that they take it a day at a time and try to get it better. I like to think that I'm a recovering racist, uh, that means that I'm still a racist in ways that continually surprise me, though probably shouldn't. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I'm, and I think, uh, and I don't know whether you would support this, but I, I have many African-American students at Duke Divinity School, and I've been known to say to some of them when we get into conversations and all, I say, look, with my accent, you can tell I'm from South Carolina, and then you can see... Uh, my color of my skin, et cetera, be careful with me. Uh, I, I, I really want to be better. I really want to treat you justly, but I probably will need your help. So when I cross a line or when I put something the wrong way, uh, help me think about that. <clears throat> and it's, in fact, one of the reasons I love teaching. <clears throat> so... So you're saying that you talk to your black students and you ask the victims, if, um, or you ask your black students to teach you how or talk to you or show you how you're being a racist? Because I guess my next question is, um, how do you <laughs> practice racism? What do, what do you do every day that, where you're practicing racism or when you stumble across it and you're practicing racism? Well, I, mean, I think I'm, 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 I'm a beneficiary of racial privilege. <clears throat> Um, you know, that I didn't create, I didn't pay for, but it still doesn't make it right. I mean, the sense I have gotten a wonderful education, most of which I didn't pay for. Uh, I have used that education to get power. Uh, I live in a certain neighborhood. I benefit from laws that I didn't make, but nevertheless have racial consequences. So I think in that sense, uh, you know, it's a continuing project. Uh, I hang out with certain people. I attend a certain church. Uh, my pastor of my church is an African-American, but there are not that many African-Americans in the congregation. Um, but so I think uh, I'm a white Southerner, and I think 
therefore I ought to realize this this is deep and I'll be my whole life being delivered of this. But I don't know that I'll okay. achieve yeah. I'm, so, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just have one last question. No, I just um, based off of your responses. Um, sounds like you are around a lot of non-white uh, people, black people, and so would you consider yourself, or do you think they consider you a good white person? <laughs> oh, you'll have to interview them, for, but I think some of them do, and yet some of them, uh, I think, are, uh, I've, I've told Gus I like his suspiciousness. I think some of them... I've had lots of experiences to know, gee, uh, you know, uh, you hope white people will be good uh, in their responses to you, but but be wary. Uh, I had a student, for instance, who challenged me about a grade uh, last semester. And he asked me, he said, now, about a third of the class was African-American. Uh, how was their grade? He didn't like the grade I'd given him. And he said, how, how was their grade distribution? And I said, that's a fair question. And I said, let me look. And uh, it turns out he had, they had all, all the African-American students had made better grades than he had. But nevertheless, I, I didn't resent it. I just thought, uh, good, you need to think about that. Check me out. And I must say I was relieved when it didn't look like there was a grading pa pattern by race. Uh, if there had been, I hope I would have acknowledged it and said to myself, I wonder how that has affected the way I sign grades in this class. And so, uh, and by the way, I, I don't know whether this was your, an earlier point, but when you said, uh, you know, is it, is it up to the victims of oppression to educate me? No, and and I'm sure African Americans get sick and tired of having to call to attention, explain. On the other hand, I must say I just don't know as a white person how you can get over this. You can get better at this. You can have your eyes open without some patient uh, help from friends uh, of of color who can help you so but hmm. uh, okay that's the end of my question Jeff, can you play the sound clip out of buckets and buckets of water? <laughs> what was that i didn't hear that uh, you're just saying just buckets and buckets of words that was uh, her request, which we have now gotten to take. That basically, uh, that is our oh, code okay. here at the Cows. A uh, Cows, where if we have uh, a white person, a suspected racist on the program, and someone thinks that that white person is just saying a lot of words and not answering questions or not being truthful, uh, uh -huh. just talking and trying to use words to deceive us, practice racism. So that's our uh, sound clip. The person that called in, appreciate that caller uh, in Michigan. The person that called in. Uh, this is, I guess you're calling in from a blocked uh, number. Uh, did you have a question for Professor Willimon? Uh, your line should be open. 424. Hello, heard? Yes, ma'am. Hello, this is Rick from Ohio. Um, my question is, I, I have two questions. The first question is, how, because I understand that your book basically revolves around um, what the white preacher um, said after the lynching. But you also said that, um, you also admit that, you know, the Christian, the Christian belief or the Christian religion did actually get passed down through slavery, what have you. So it, do you believe that Christianity is just another tool to further promote, refine, what have you, white supremacy, and if so, how could that then be used to help combat white, how could that be used to combat racism? You know, I'm, I'm not sure I know how, but I know that it has. One, it, it has been a tool of white supremacy, and that's 
well documented and uh, in in various ways. Uh, Paul, St. Paul, you know, writing, slaves obey your masters, etc. That was lifted out and all. On the other hand, I know in the African American church, for instance, it it uh, Christianity has been a revolutionary force. Uh, and uh, I, Nelson Mandela was talking about how, you know, that he had real problems with Christianity and yet had to admit that many of the uh, uh, <clears throat> South African freedom fighters, uh, Marxist freedom fighters and all, were educated in Christian schools, missionary schools, and that there was a connection in his case and other cases. I, I, I think that's one of the uh, ironies of the Christian faith. Uh, I'm sorry, James I, Cohen I, and I, his, I added, yeah. I'm sorry, I should have added this. And, um, what I meant was how can white people, white Christians, use a tool that is to that is basically being used to help promote their racism. How can they use that to then counter the racism? It seems like even within the wording of the Bible in itself, you know, dark is bad, white light is good. So it mm-hmm. kind of seems mm-hmm. like it's a contradiction to say that you can use Christianity to combat something that it's in turn promoting. So. That that's what I was actually um. Questioning. Oh, I see, and I, I, I that's a, you know, I think it's a mystery of when that happens. Uh, I I say that I think in some way, for me as a white Christian, I've got to become a disciple of the black church, in in some sense, and growing up in the South, uh, and then participating in the civil rights movement as a student, uh, I owe the black church, but that that sense of, uh, hey, let us open your eyes. Uh, Let us give you the courage to stand up to your parents and grandparents and all. Uh, It's a mystery. I must say, though, we Christians know that we're all capable of using Jesus for our own advantage of of trying to portray him uh, uh, as uh, a patron of our particular uh, lifestyle or race. Uh, though, as James Cohen points out in his book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, uh, the cross was a rough equivalent of, uh, of 20th century lynching. And Jesus Christ, uh, you can say what you want to about him, but he, he was a victim of this public uh, uh, execution. And that gives... That has given many Christians, uh, African Americans, uh, you know, a uh, uh, sense of kinship. So, but it is hard, and I, I think you know one thing. Uh, in my church, we start out every service confessing we're sinners, we've messed up, we have abused you, uh, uh, God, uh, in the way we've treated others. We have. So I think, you know, Christians don't believe that uh, we're perfect. We believe that we're sin, and our sin takes various forms. All right. Um, my last question is, um, I'm not sure if you uh, heard of the executive order signed by the current president where it, it um, actually is, I guess, increasing religious liberties. And uh. I had yeah, and I heard that um, white evangelists, they were very excited about that. So that kind of seemed, does that seem in your perspective to be basically a, a calling card for now white churches to further promote white supremacy? I that think it does smell like that. It just, is, uh, one, that, that religious that law or whatever it was uh, to keep churches from being politically active. I think there was white supremacy behind that law. And uh, I think it was aimed uh, particularly at African-American churches. Uh, No one, to my knowledge, no one was ever charged with that law. So Trump then does this bogus thing of abrogating that law, which has never been enforced. And, uh, I, I agree that I, 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 
it's beyond my imagination that any preacher, evangelical or otherwise, would find anything in Donald Trump and who he is or what he does to praise. And so if there is praise for that, I'm suspicious. But, and I must say, I think uh, whites, we whites have demonstrated through history we're capable of using any idea, any law, any institution uh, for the presence of white supremacy. Right on. I think that answered her uh, questions. Appreciate that, Red. Uh, <laughs> the person that called in uh, last four, di- <clears throat> excuse me, the person that called in last four digits, uh, three, two, four, six, three, two, four, six. Did you have a question for Professor Willimon? Yes, sir. Um, my question um, was uh, when white people are inevitably and permanently extinct, is it possible that there will still be white supremacy? <laughs> wow. I have no idea. Uh, I, I can't imagine it being the same kind of... I, I don't know. Um, what, what is your point there that... Uh, is this something that is exclusive? Is, is racism exclusive to the white race or I, I, yeah I was just I was I'm, referring to white supremacy I was wondering yeah when white white when white people are um, inevitably extinct and permanently extinct will there or could there possibly be white supremacy ah <sighs> gee I just that's kind of beyond my powers of uh, imagination I, I guess um uh, I do think in a weird way, and maybe this is the work of God, but America, America, North America, the world, maybe you're pointing to this, does seem to be, uh, some have called this browning or uh, changing the color cast. I wonder if white people having once been uh, in supreme positions by their own efforts, uh, and and laws and all. I, I wonder if they are being divested. I mean, this is maybe a minor thing, but I've thought, uh, I've said to some white people who say they voted for Trump, uh, well, enjoy it, because surely that'll be the last election that a group of white males can determine who's president. Uh is that the last gasp of a kind of white supremacy? I I wonder. Uh, my second question was, when do scientists predict what what do what is the time frame that scientists predict that white people will go extinct? <laughs> Gosh, I have not pondered this. I'm sorry. I'm not a scientist, but. Uh, I will go extinct uh, in a few years. I'm 70. I am the same age as Donald Trump. Um, but uh, I don't know. You know, I'm, I don't know whether Gus knows that or not. But, uh, you know, do you, do you take heart in thinking that that will change the situation racially? Well, I mean, it's, it'll have to change the situation racially. I'd... I, Sorry, I just don't. You're you're thinking beyond me. My last question. Yes. Uh, should black people help white people go extinct in the shortest time frame possible? <laughs> I'm not meaning to laugh. Um, I, I, uh, oh, gee. Uh, what are your plans for extinction or... Uh, yeah, I'm, I I am not one to tell black people what to do, but uh, yeah, I I'm doing my part. As I say, I'm seventy and I'm on my way out, and uh, that will be one less uh, white supremacist to look at, I guess. Uh, but I, I I don't know. 
I mean, let me ask you, this. Uh, what's your age? Oh, I think they said that was his uh, final question. Uh, oh, so that was his have, last thing he, yes, he, sir. he signed so out. He I'm might sorry. Have, okay. Uh, dispersed. Uh, the person who dialed in last four digits, or it looks like they dialed in from a, a wireless block number. Did you have a question? Oh, this is Emmy. <laughs> got confused. Emmy, did you have a question uh, for Professor Willimon? Greetings, everybody. I actually do have a quick question. Um, earlier in the broadcast, Gus was speaking and asking you questions, and you mentioned that you liked his level of suspicion, um, and you kind of chuckled. It was kind of like a tear a little bit. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more. You are 70. I'm thank you for telling me that. That means you have been here for a long time. And so why is it so healthy for black people to be suspicious of all white people? Because it seems like it caught you off guard a little bit. And so I'm just curious if you could expound on that. Huh. You, you know, I was for 20 years a chaplain at Duke. And I would have African-American students. And, of course, these are very talented uh, young people, uh, high achievers academically and all who would be um, caught off guard and deeply pained by evidence of racism. And uh, I can remember a young woman uh, telling me through tears that uh, she was friends with everybody on the hall and they all just had one big happy family. And then Thanksgiving break came along and... Uh, all the girls on the hall were going to Cancun or somewhere, uh, or New Jersey. <laughs> uh, but her, uh, she wasn't invited. And she said it was just so obvious. And she said, I think it's because I'm black. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, gee, you're, you're very smart and you're 21 years old. Wow. Uh, and maybe that's not what we're talking about, but I, I just think uh, part of the survival skills of being in America are to uh, develop a healthy kind of, maybe suspicion is the wrong word, that seems kind of a negative word, but I'd say critical thinking, uh, astute, maybe better than suspicion, uh, wise, uh, uh in, in these matters, and that uh, I think uh, that just seems to me a good quality. Do you think that's not a good quality, or what? Wh how, what's your take on that? Um, I think it's healthy. Thank you for answering the question. My next one is, since you are 70, when did you stop practicing racism? And these are really short because I don't want to take up anyone's time. So, like, how many years ago did you call yourself stop practicing racism or stop being a racist? Uh, um, well, I've admitted, I, I think it's a continuing process. And I guess I'd be suspicious of anybody saying, uh, when I was 21, I, I grew out of my racism and my white supremacy upbringing and, and I was born again and I'm pure. Uh, I mentioned in my book, for instance, when I was 16 and that, I remember that as a great big moment for me when a young 16-year-old, uh, uh, a guy from my town, and yet we went to different schools, different churches and everything, uh, showed me, told me uh, what it was like to b grow up in Greenville uh, and be African-American. And I remember that as a kind of uh, a big eye-opening experience. Uh, but also that, I think that kind of prepared me for a bunch of other experiences. And, uh, hey, I mean, I'm 70 years old, and tonight this has been <laughs> a growth experience for me, being on Gus's show and having these conversations. So I can't point to kind of one moment. Okay. So um, since it's, the only reason I asked for that one moment is because if we were going to liken this to alcoholism and someone is a recovering addict, there's like a date that they say they stop. And then from that point forward, they're constantly, like, in recovery. So I was wondering if you had that. You know, that's a great, yeah, that's a great point. Kind of extending my metaphor. I, I must, right. one reason I like the 
alcohol metaphor, though, is I think that, you know, an alcoholic will tell you, you know, I'm, I'm not cured. Nobody's ever cured. Uh, I'm capable of falling off the wagon right now uh, in the right situation and all. So I like, but yeah, and I do know alcoholics who can point to the day and the hour. I know a lot of them, though, who, who would say, gosh, it was a bunch of different painful encounters and interventions. And I think maybe I'm more that way. Okay. Um, so what are the ways that you practice racism and how have you passed racism on? If you're 70, that means you've come into contact with a lot of white people. You've done a lot of things, you know, with no non-white people around. Um, you could tell us some of the things that y'all talk about when we're not around and some of the ways that you practice it. Because as far as I'm concerned, my entire purpose for participating and listening is to learn from you about the system of white supremacy, and you are, um, you teach at Duke, and you are older, so you should have a lot of good information. And our second business, I'm just speaking really quickly about the request for a joke. That's part of that, so that you can, you know, give us some useful information, because the system of white supremacy isn't like a privilege or privilege. Yeah. Or against that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I'm, uh, the joke thing has been one of the big learnings, uh, but, but, uh, uh, yeah, well, you know, here, I'm a tenured faculty member at Duke University, and uh, yet I have participated in discussions uh, where everybody in the room is white, and we're talking about, say, a black faculty member, uh, about someone joining our faculty, and should we give this person an invitation or not? And then somebody in the room says, uh, well, you know, she seemed angry, but she seemed strident in her lecture. Well, those are kind of code words, can be code words among white people for talking about, you know, angry black people. And uh, nobody said, gee, you know, she's African-American, I'm just not sure about her. But they said other things, and then I would say, um, uh, well, you know, I, I, I found her lecture energetic and strong, and um, I, I think the students would respond to that uh, positively. And then somebody says, well, that, that's the problem. I think, you know, she will be teaching students. And uh, the, uh, so I, I guess I'm <laughs> suspicious that race is a factor in such conversations. And I think particularly when it's just white people in the room and there's nobody to monitor or anything, then, so I don't know whether that's the kind of thing you were thinking about. I, I guess, you know, I'm in a situation at, at Duke where the white people I'm around are very well self-monitored and very careful about what they talk about and how they express themselves. So, therefore, if there is racism, it's really darn subtle. Uh, yeah. Um, and I guess... What uh, are some of the subtle yeah. ways? Uh, if we could, could you share some of those subtle ways, kind of in like a bullet point for me, subtle ways that we, <sighs> white people, practice racism, white supremacy is? I'm with you. Um... The, uh, well, um, I, I, uh, I think uh, the way we vote, uh, the way the people that we socialize with, uh, the uh, uh, values, I mean, little things like saying somebody's music is too loud or somebody has a chip on their shoulder or something. Again, uh, the, the racism that, that I practice and encounter is, may seem to others subtle, refined, genteel. It, it can be, though, even more deadly. Uh, but anyway, you're trying to get... See, I'm a professor, and I can't do bullet points, but uh, <laughs> um, th those, I, I guess... I find that kind of thing troubling uh, and also with subtlety. I mean, when 
friends who are white say to me, gosh, I don't have a racist bone in my body. I said, uh, what's the last conversation you've had with an African-American person? Uh, when's the last time you've been out socially? Uh, when have you been invited uh, into an African-American home? Or Well, pretty quickly, declarations of uh, I don't have a racist bone in my body wilt uh, before that. And then finally, and then I'll let you go. You mentioned um, all of the privileges that you as a white person get under the system of white supremacy. And I've been giving this word privilege a lot of consideration because I think it's, it's a double speak and it's just incorrect altogether. Um, I would consider hmm. some rewards for your participation in white supremacy. What are your thoughts on that? Ooh, I, wow, that's, that's very helpful. I mean, that, that, that gets it up. Uh, uh, rewards for bad behavior or rewards, yeah, for your ideology. Uh, yeah, I, I found the term privilege very helpful uh, because it, it gets to the naming, the invisibility, the uh, uh, claiming all the things that I've received. But as you say, it's rewards uh, that a white society gives for people playing the game and being part of it and not questioning it and not working against it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's Brian, helpful. Do you feel guilty or bad or do you take any responsibility in um, the system of white supremacy? Yeah, I, I confess it as a sin. Uh, uh, that means something, you know, as a Christian. Uh, yeah, I, and I often tell myself, gee, well, what do I do? Uh, I just read a book by uh, Eric Dyson, and he kind of says in there, okay, stop feeling bad, uh, move on to action. And he gets down to even like if you have an African-American person waiting on you in a restaurant, tip them more than you would. Well, just start your own little reparations program. And I realize, I mean, most of my uh, charitable giving, I think, is an inadequate, but it's maybe my little attempt to say, okay, I've got these material rewards. Uh, how can I use those uh, to, as my little personal reparation program? Uh, so maybe that seems pretty lame, but. Anyway, I guess it's my effort to move beyond feeling bad to actually taking action. Uh, hang tight, Emmy. Uh, caller dialed in from a black number. Did you have a quick question for Professor Willem? Uh, yeah, Gus, here I'm. Uh, I, I didn't know how long we were going to be on this, and I'm going to have to sign out shortly. Is that uh, possible? Do you have time to get one more caller? Yeah, I do. I will. Sure. Let's yeah. get the caller who dialed in from a block number. Did you have a question? Last question for Professor Willimon. Caller that dialed in from a block number. Are you just listening, or did you have a question? Oh, well, let's try again. Caller dialed in. Uh, looks like you're at a block number. Did you have a question, or are you just listening? Hello. Yes, sir. Oh, oh, it's caller from Canada, Gus. Oh, greetings. Good to hear from you. Yeah, I didn't. Okay, yeah. Sorry, I wasn't sure you meant. Um, just one quick question. Oops. I just noticed one quick question mm -hmm. for the yeah. guest. How is it possible to identify a recovering racist when the system of white supremacy still exists? Why not just simply say that you're still racist? And that's my question. And I'll mute my mouth. Hmm. Well, I guess, and I'm I'm kind of speaking individualistically there, uh, uh, but yeah, I guess I'm trying to be hopeful <laughs> that one can be, uh, by the grace of God, uh, uh, cleansed of this to, to a certain extent, uh, and that the the racism is not you know, created by God, it's not eternal, it's something we did, or they're doing. And so the recovering 
I, I think moves toward the hope, uh, the aspiration that this is uh, not in the created order of things, but it is uh, something that we can change. <laughs> Did that answer your question, caller in Canada? <laughs> Um, no, because it doesn't explain why you just can't say the person is racist. Oh, well, I can. I mean, I, I, I can say I'm racist. I, I guess I'm hopefully recovering racist, but, and I can certainly say that there are plenty of, uh, uh, white supremacists that are not recovering at all. And they are, uh, happy in their racism. They are, uh, yeah. So. If that's your point, I I can sure agree to that. Okay, I I think that's clear. A bit confused, but I think that's clear enough for me. Uh, I will insert since I did raise that point earlier. Uh, I, I just I pay attention to words, a lot of metaphors uh, from Professor Willimon. I talk about that on a regular basis. White people using metaphors in conversations on racism. <clears throat> I heard and laughed again. Heard the use of the term "fair" uh, in there, and it's not even just that Professor Willimon says that he is a recovering racist. It says that he would like to think that he is a recovering racist, which is even trickier. Uh, I would say, I would like to think that I'm a millionaire. That doesn't mean that I'm a millionaire. That's what I mean about what we need is accuracy. You, we began the program, Professor Willimon said that specifically. That's one thing that white people can do if they you know, are for real, sincerely upset about racism is just call things what they are, being accurate and truthful about things. And in my view, the recovering racist is not accurate until this problem has been solved. It's accurate. It's honest. Professor Willimon, racist, not recovering, just racist. Could be <laughs> some, okay. something for our listeners to ponder on the book we've been discussing, uh, Who Lynched? Willie Earl uh, by uh, Professor William Willimont down at Duke University. The Duke Blue Devils that did come to mind during the program. Uh, Duke Blue Devils, thank you so much for sharing some of your Tuesday evening. Hopefully we can have you back on the program. I'm sure South Carolina and racism will be oh, well, Gus, uh, Thank you. I've, I've really enjoyed the conversation and um, uh, your and your callers really enriched the experience. Thank you. Yes, sir. Evening, uh, Professor Willimont. Good evening. Mm -hmm. Context of white supremacy. Wowee. Wowee. Uh, we'll be back Thursday. Workplace Racism, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, dial in if you have commentary, if you want to write an email, uh, if you want to call in live and share. We'll be looking forward to hearing from folks this Thursday evening. Again, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Friday, we'll be here. I think this is the final study session on Coretta Scott King's autobiography, My Life, My Love, my legacy uh, this Friday, same time, and the compensatory call in Saturday, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. Uh, before we get, I think we missed some of the callers. I don't think everybody got a question in. Uh, my fault, not doing a better job managing uh, getting everybody who dialed in with a hand up, but we will open the lines up so you can get your observations or if you had a question you want to share, which you were going to ask, we'll make time for that as well. Uh, just to make sure I get in, uh, number one. We are listener-supported, counter-racist radio. Uh, invest if you think the program is constructive. Racism hyphen notes dot blogspot dot com. Racism hyphen notes dot blogspot dot com. PayPal button is in the top right corner. If you are not into PayPal, drop us an email. We will get you a physical mailing address a uh, huge thanks to all the folks who have supported invested in us eight plus years uh, hopefully we have helped to give out constructive information on what racism is how it works what it means to be white and questions the importance of asking white people questions like professor willimon uh great job folks uh asking questions and just being suspicious of white people that's you know extremely important as well, this might be another one with uh, some great illustrations of why you should be very mindful when whites begin using metaphors about racism. Uh, that's it. Anything, uh, I'm trying to think of anything that I want to make sure I point out. Uh, since uh, 
Benjamin Ryan, Pitchfork Ben Tillman was mentioned. Uh, my favorite quote is the, the threat of Negro domination hangs over us like the sword of Damocles. However, the most important quote from the book, uh, the biography on Tillman, uh, Ben Tillman and the Reconstruction of White Supremacy that we read in 2015. If you scratch the white man too deep, you will find the same savage whose ancestry used to roam wild in Britain. Ben Tillman and the Reconstruction of White Supremacy. Just my quick comments uh, from from Professor uh, Willimon. Um, when I read the book, uh, I just thought, wow, this is like, you know, really dangerous. This is a really dangerous uh, suspected or well, he admitted it. This is a really dangerous race soldier, uh, in my opinion, because I think a lot of black people, a lot of victims would read his material or hear him and think that this is, you know, a great white guy. He's doing this research and telling the story. He's a Christian. You know, the, the religion of white supremacy has been so effective that. Uh, for a lot of uh, black people, particularly if they are Christian, that alone will be enough. This is a Christian white person coming and saying that they, you know, acknowledge racism and have done work on it and are working through it. I'm a recovering racist and, you know, trying my best to repent from my, you know, white supremacist ways. Uh, that would would trick uh, a lot of victims. That was what I thought uh, in reading his book. Uh, and. He kind of uh, demonstrated that I was not very surprised by a lot of uh, his antics. Uh, on the program, I thought his laughter at points was uh, very important. And that same sort of narrative uh, that black people are the experts uh, on racism, that he's learned so much about racism from black people, that white people are the ones who are ignorant or blind or unconscious or need to be informed. Uh, we've heard all that before, uh, that white people can be redeemed. He's writing this book so that the good white Christians will pray and get their congregations uh, in order. Standard procedure that I've heard before. And, and even in my view, this is not someone who's uh, his field of study, right, is not U.S. history. Uh, he's in divinity uh, and Christian studies. That's what most of his books and writing is about. But he is very informed uh, about the history of white supremacy in this part of the world. That's why, you know, I try to, to emphasize that sort of thing on a on a regular basis. Just the standard uh, tackiness. I'd even get that in since he found a chuckle uh, about that. The standard tackiness that I see from whites where they try to do a good job uh, of eliciting praise from victims at the same time confusing us that they're racist and giving you that line that they're ignorant, that they're not informed. They learned uh, from black people. Uh, we'll get some of the folks who dialed in who uh, did not get an opportunity to ask a question. Uh, if you want to share your observations or even if you just want to share what question uh, you had planned to ask before uh, he departed right at the two hour mark. Uh, let's see, people that we missed uh, completely, if you wanted to uh, get your question. And I think uh, the person that dialed in last four digits... Uh, 8617, you were one of the people that we missed completely. Uh, the black female caller in Brooklyn, uh, in New York, sorry. Um, I know you all are two that we missed completely. I think there might be one other. Did you two have uh, commentary, either your question you were going to ask or what you were going to share? Can I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Good evening, Gus. Another great show. You know, kind of difficult to get through sometimes, you know, um, especially when you got, you're under the cloak of white Jesus. But anyway, um, I just wanted to ask him, uh, you know, I, I often have these encounters with white children, you know, in New York, I used to get on the elevator with them and they would, you know, you know, they, you know, they give you that look, you know, but, uh, you know, cause you're a nigger. And, uh, uh, I've even had one of them say to me, say to their mother one time, uh, see, mommy, I'm not afraid. And, uh, you know, so I was going to ask him exactly what is it that white women tell their children um, about black people, how to relate to black people um, when, you know, when they're little. Because Mr. Fuller always tells us that um, we should talk to our children about racism as soon as they ask. And, um, you know, being that we are victims, I'm thinking that we are, this thing is skewed, this thing that we're, we, 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 we know, unfortunately, because we are confused and because of our condition, we often give them the wrong information. Uh, but 
apparently these little white children are getting the right information so that they can survive in the system that's dominated by uh, their people, um, if you want to call them people. So I was going to ask him exactly what it was that his mother told him as a child to ensure that he could survive in the system. That's all. Thank you for for letting me share. Mm. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Hi, how you doing? Um, greetings to everybody, Gus the callers. Um, I basically wanted to ask him um, how, how does he feel about racism right now um, being from past, present, to future. Do he feel like it's getting better? Um, do we, are we getting better on race relations or are we getting worse? And depending on that, I was going to say, you know, with all of them, with, um, with them erasing history out of uh, textbooks in Texas and um, also with these new laws they have, they have a law that they just, um, about the past with uh, race soldiers, once they kill victims, unarmed black people, that the victim's parents aren't going to be allowed to receive any um, compensation for it. And then they have another uh, uh, law inside um, Atlanta called Drug Whisper, which um, basically they give authorizations to officers, 250 officers, to basically, um, if they suspect that you are under the influence, and I think that's a great point that you make, um, you've always iterated that from day one about us being um, sober under the system of global white supremacy. And now, being that a lot of people, um, especially in, in our um, community that, you know, do a little smoke or they go ahead and drink and, you know, just enjoy themselves on the weekend, even if you don't, don't have any of that in your system, they have footage that officers are locking you up just because they base, they think that you are under the influence. And when you look up on YouTube and you see the, the cases they had on the news and people been locked up for the whole weekend and when it gets down to the prosecutor, they throw their case out because they never had no evidence inside of their system of any type of drug. And then you have uh, Richard Spence and his little race soldiers going up there to Virginia. I was going to say that's, not too far from him, and um, basically, you know, tormenting people in the villages. So are they refining it? I was going to ask him. These are just refining instead of um, basically trying to eliminate the global system of white supremacy. But I didn't get a chance to get that in there because I, I really wanted to pinpoint him from the get-go by asking him if he thinks it's getting better, and then I would have brought all of that to him to, like, you know, basically trap him into what he would say. I don't think, like, as a um, him being 70, I don't think it's more of him just trying to um, get rid of a system or trying to better themselves. I just feel like a lot of these races, when they get to that age, they think of, of the afterpath. Like, they're, they're, they're more on trying to cleanse their soul with black people before they get out of here. And I think that's one of the reasons why he kept stressing about his age and really not worried about anybody else. And that's all I have. I'll meet my life. Appreciate that, sir. Appreciate the commentary. Wish you got your questions in. Um, I think there might have been one other person that we missed completely. Uh, the caller 7720. Did you? Oh, maybe you already got you. Was there one other person that we missed uh, completely who had commentary that we didn't get to hear from? Uh, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, greetings, uh, Gus, and to the listeners. Um, I wanted to ask them. Well, he, he kept mentioning the whole thing about, you know, uh, the recovery and uh, like uh, AA. And I wanted to kind of go along those lines uh, and, you know, mention that white people are really great at planning. And in, in his specific area um, with, uh, with him being professor and also, you know, doing things with churches and whatnot, I wanted to ask him what were white people's plans uh, for to, to refine and expand the system of white supremacy uh, over the next few years. I, I didn't think that he would answer, honestly, but I figured why not ask him. Hmm. Good questions. Good questions. Wow. Uh, the All the other folks who dialed in, if you have a hand up, if you did uh, get to ask a question and you just want to share some of your observations, some of the patterns 
uh, that you heard, uh, anything that you just want to point out as being significant, if you uh, would like to share, you can feel free as well. Any of the other folks who dialed in with a hand up, you all have commentary or folks satisfied? Oh, I think we missed, uh, Amy might have missed a few folks' lines. Sorry about that, uh, firefighter. And, uh, oh, can I be heard? Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, yeah, I, I uh, noticed uh, through his uh, conversation, uh, he kept using the term surviving, survival, as if that is a, uh, uh attribute of achievement. If people are surviving, that, that means that there's something that's causing a desperate type of situation with people if they're surviving. That's not the ultimate uh, aspect of, of uh, living. Uh, and so, uh, and I'm sure that he's aware of that. Uh, also, it was something else that I was thinking about that he... Uh, uh, kept uh, kept alluding to um, uh, yes uh, you 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 don't measure racism by supremacy by degrees or me being a football coach by yardage it either exists or it doesn't exist period I mean please they they can they can play that they have been playing that game with us talking about improvements. The, the only improvement that I'm interested in is, is the solving of the problem and replacing it with a system of justice, period. That's it. You know, that's, that's the only logical explanation behind countering racism, white supremacy. And uh, I noticed that uh, there's something that, that uh, he, did, he didn't do a good job of explaining because he was lying, I, I would suspect. Uh, he didn't do a good job of explaining uh, this idea about uh, somebody's being biased, whatever the hell that means, and never did explain the idea of something called a white Christian or even a black Christian. You know, they, they, what, the hell, what the hell does that mean? White Christian, black Christian, black church, white church. Uh, logically speaking, I don't think the creator created a, a, a person... Uh, uh, by some sort of race classification, a black person or a white person. I don't think the creator, logically speaking, created something like that. It was All that was created by white people to practice terror against people they identify as being non-white. And those, those were my last thoughts. Thank you. Appreciate that, retired firefighter. Uh, other folks have commentary whether you got to uh, ask Professor Willimon a question or not. Did other folks have uh, either question, observation, patterns? Can I be heard? Uh, yes, Emmy, you could speak up a little bit. That would be good. Is this better? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, so about the entire conversation and into the question. He had a extremely nonchalant way of talking about it. And um, I wanted to, if I had a lot more time to just sit and ask him more questions, or if he took, if he didn't take so long to answer the question. Um, I don't know that, like, I don't think that white people think that we understand the severity of the problem. And that's one of the ways that they're able to just talk the way that they talk all the time. Um, like, they know that it's worse than how even we know. And so to just be like, yeah, you know, I just kind of benefit and all that kind of stuff, it doesn't, it completely skews what's really happening, which is why I don't, I don't really like the term, or I don't, not that I don't like it, it's non-constructive, and it's deceptive to use the term privilege. And I think that when you say something is a privilege, it means that you didn't have to do anything for it, it just kind of is. And I really don't think those things are just there. Um, so that's why I wanted him to be honest about the word privilege um, and focus on, like, what if we called it, like, those things are your rewards. That's what you get by practicing racism. And then if that's the case, then you would have to at least, you'd have to enumerate specifically what you're saying and, how, like, 
ignorant specifically how you practice racism, white supremacy, and not just say that it's a privilege. I don't see how any 70-year-old white man, Southern white man, admitted racist, can be asked the question, how do you practice racism? How have you practiced racism? How did you pass it on? And not just get a linear answer. I taught my kids this. I teach my grandkids this. I've said these things to my white students that I didn't say to my black students. I've given, like, it should just be simple. And the fact that it wasn't like that, to me, um, is a very clear example of the subtle ways that white people are practicing racism, which he still didn't enumerate the way that I wanted. And that whole thing about being a professor and not doing bullet points, that's a lie. Professors love bullet points and PowerPoints. Um, but anyway, that was something that I just noted. The over, It's because they all sound like that. Um, just really blase and nonchalant about such a, a serious condition that we're in. So thank you all for listening. Agreed, agreed. Uh, other folks? Uh, yes, yes, we can eat. Um, I just wanted to share, uh, you know, just his uh, demeanor to me uh, just proves that uh, once again, another white person not serious about um, producing justice. Uh, he just had a real, you know, the, the chuckling that he did, um, the way that he was just using the buckets of words. It was just not serious. And so I just l try to study uh, this behavior that these white people, when they come on the program, um, just how they behave. And it just continuously proved to me that they're not serious um, about replacing the system at all. They're serious about practicing racism and continuously trying to confuse black people or non-white people. Um, he stated that in his 70 years, uh, I, I don't know exactly the words he used, but he said something to the point like, you know, this was the most uh, intense kind of, you know, questioning that he's received. I'm like, you're a professor, you're around, you know, you're teaching, but you're not getting questioned like, uh, in the manner in which he was getting questioned on his call. And so it just continuously um, proved to me how effective the question, questions, questioning white people are um, with no emotions, not, you know, getting all worked up on their answers, but just really trying to um, get a solid answer from them. So it's just really helping me uh, in, in, in this process, and I just uh, I got a lot out of the conversation uh, this evening. I'll mute myself. Mom in Detroit, right on, right on. Uh, other folks, uh, anything stand out? Uh, anything notable about uh, Professor Willimon's performance? What he had to say. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Yeah, I just wanted to note. Um, I don't know if you got it, Gus, but he kept saying suspicion, suspicion, and he kept focusing on you. And I was going to ask him if I had the chance, like at his highest point um, of him practicing white supremacy, if he was around you and he felt that he was so, he was curious about your suspicion. And basically that means like, you know, you just know a lot, you know, and you could be figured, uh, you could be seen as dangerous in his eyes. If he would end up getting you killed or having someone kill you, and that would have been my question. And I'll just move, move my line on that. Uh, yeah, I think he would have he would have went hard on his uh, white Christianity bit on that one. I said, oh, my goodness, no. You know, I'm, I'm trying as best I can. I'm, you know, doing my 12-step process. Uh, I think it's great. And, you know, I admire him. And he's learned so much. And he should have a good pride. I think he would have had a good, good uh, comeback on that one. That... That recovering addicts, he, he uses that language in the book uh, that I read in preparation, and we've heard that before. Uh, Joe Fegan, he was a guest on the program. He wrote Two-Faced Racism in addition to a lot of other books. He used that same uh, phrasing, recovering racist, and for the reasons that were pointed out on the program, it's inaccurate. Uh, but in addition, that metaphor, people generally, or I, I won't say all, but often, when people talk about uh, people who are suffering from alcoholism, they sometimes talk about that person as though they are a victim, uh, as though that individual should be sympathized with. 
uh, that this person is suffering from a disease. This person has an affliction that makes them behave in the manner that they do and we're trying to get them help. That's not applicable to whites at all. It's totally different <laughs> when you just say, hey, I enjoy mistreating niggers and that's what we're going to do. Uh, whether it's motivated from white genetic annihilation or whatever, at the end of the day, if that's the behavior that you're engaged in, that's not something that you sympathize with. That's not something where we need to think of you as a victim. That's not something where we need to think of you as somebody that's recovering. That should be recognized as criminal and terroristic behavior uh, that you have shown you are totally unwilling to stop doing. That's the way that we should think about it. Uh, I also thought uh, his response at the very, uh, very beginning of the program about white people being sincerely pained. That question sometimes can be a great uh, range finder. If I could use a boxing metaphor, uh, sometimes people use your jab just to kind of find where your opponent is and kind of gauge your speed. That question can be very good to just see. Now, how honest is this white person willing to be? We've had a lot of white people who've come on this program who have said no. That is not true. White people do not feel bad about racism. No time, no day, no. That is just false. We've had a good number of white people who've come on and lied, like Professor Willimon tried to say, oh, yeah, we're all shook. I was crying about racism just, you know, five minutes before the program started. I do that. We've had a good number that tried, and even when he tried that, when he kept talking, he revealed, like, no, I mean, that's just not the case. Uh, that's, you know, that's one reason why I continue to ask that question at the beginning to just kind of it can be a good way to see. Now, how honest is this uh, racist going to be with us? And he did admit to being a racist on the program. I'm going to change the uh, description to reflect that. Anything else stand out from Professor Willimon? Folks good with what, what he had to say? We had a lot of chuckles uh, during the course of the uh, broadcast. I thought his, his response to the uh, sexual intercourse question was great as well because strong. Thurman, it was right there. He brought it up before I even got to it. Uh, this racist in South Carolina who raped a black child and had a, a produced offspring with her. Uh, that how he tried to pivot and not even discuss the sexual intercourse uh, bit of the question. It's oh, I'm a preacher, you know. I don't. We don't even uh, talk about you know sexual intercourse, which is anyway. Uh, any any other comments, folks? Want to make sure they got in? May I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Gus did. Uh I uh, just wanted to say that that female child that uh, Strom Thurmond uh, uh, had uh, after he uh, sexually sewered a, a, the black woman, that offspring was a graduate from HBCU, my HBCU, South Carolina State. So there's a whole uh, another backstory to that whole thing. I think she wrote a book. She sure I'm not did. Mistaken or. Didn't she write a book? And she moved to Seattle, no less. <laughs> like uh, I've been thinking yeah. that we should we should read that for the book club. But yep, she sure did write yeah. a book. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, so I wanted to know because I I couldn't I was in and out on the uh, on the program. So did uh, did you ever get to discuss with him this uh, this um, white psychosis frenzy that's uh, apparent now where all of the uh, so-called, so-called dedicated monuments to uh, um, racism and the Confederate, the, the Confederate monuments uh, all over the country, this big fervor about them being taken down. Did, I, did they ever come up with him? Uh, quickly, it came up at the beginning because uh, we talked about how they did, even though they did take down the Confederate uh, flag in South Carolina that they did not remove the statue of Strom Thurmond. They did not remove uh, the statue of Ben Tillman or the, a lot of the buildings that are still named after them, even though they did take the uh, flag down. Most of the stuff is still up. He did uh, touch on that kind of at the very beginning of the program. Okay. There's also a um, um, highway like down the block from me now. It's Strom Thurmond Thruway of highway or something like that so wow. you know i mean yeah <laughs> yeah he said you know i mean I, and like i said i just think that that the whole thing is like some kind of part of the psychosis and um i have a friend that's into uh, he has built this whole business where he sleeps in slave cabins so uh you know i have mixed feelings about that too you know so i mean because all of these uh all of these slave cabins and these plantations you know you know, these white people are not giving up these vestiges of their niggers, you know, so, and I mean, it's a whole, 
you know, it's a whole show. You know, there's a whole reenactment and all these things going on. So, you know, I'm trying, I'm really trying to hold my head being here. But anyway, thanks for letting me share. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I, uh, I just wrote about the Confederate monuments being uh, removed in uh, New Orleans. And, I mean, you take one down, you've got 5,000 other plaques and monuments and statues and shrines to uh, various racists. Uh, they just uh, abound uh, throughout, throughout the, uh, not just in South Carolina or Louisiana, throughout the world. Uh, did other folks uh, that tuned in, other folks have commentary, observations they wanted to make sure they got in? Uh, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Um, thank you. Um, I actually sat in on a few AA meetings, and um, they are filled with white people. And uh, I was shocked and amazed to see, well, I guess I shouldn't be shocked about anything in the system of white supremacy. Um, however, uh, there were white people in there who had killed people in traffic accidents, uh, so on and so forth. And I, I agree wholeheartedly with you that it turned into this whole thing where the people who have done these things turn into the victim. And a lot of them were never convicted of any crimes, so they served very little time. And then they'll get, you know, uh, their their uh, couple of weeks or months of sobriety, and they go back out and do the same thing. So um, I agree with you wholeheartedly on that analogy. Absolutely, and that again, that's white people uh, to be under the influence and to be able to go out and commit, you know, all these crimes and what have you, and still be exonerated. That, and that was a part of this story, these drunk white people going out, acting a fool, and or I won't say acting a fool, just going out and being white, terrorizing black people and killing, uh, mutilating and killing uh, Willie Earl, who it seems was totally innocent, didn't do anything, just a black victim of white terrorism. In 19, and to put that in context, this is 1947. Again, this is the same year that this lynching happened, the same year that Jackie Robinson integrated Major League Baseball. This is seven years before uh, Emmett Till uh, was lynched, just to kind of put this in greater context. Uh, when I say like Jackie Robinson, he could have easily been killed at any time. Like they were going down south to play baseball easily. They could have killed anywhere, any stadium, any group of white people could have just said, you know, we're tired of this. We're not going to have any niggas playing baseball today and went out and killed him. And that would have been that easily, anytime. Uh, any other commentary folks had about Professor uh, Willimon, what he had to say? He included a passage uh, in the book where he was talking about all this, where at this time period, uh, it was law understood law in South Carolina that if a white person is walking down the street, a black person is coming, you have to get off the sidewalk. I was going to ask him to contrast that to the incident that happened last week with Richard Collins, the third, the black male who was killed uh, in Maryland, where the white race soldier told him step left. And the black person didn't, Mr. Collins didn't move fast enough. And so he stabbed him and killed him. Just that same pathology. And again, white people are not ignorant. This is what's being transferred uh, generation to generation. Those racist jokes, that's really important as well. I'll re, uh, reaffirm what I said to him. Uh, racist jokes, that's one of the few times when white people are speaking honestly about black people, speaking honestly about racism. That's when you will not get buckets and buckets of words, you'll get it, you know, 100 proof, 200 proof, really. Um, but, yeah, and he could not remember any racist jokes. That's been a pattern for years now. We've had white guests on the program. Sometimes I'll prime them. I'll give them a racist jokes because I've heard a lot over the years. I'll give them one. And frequently, and I think it's happened on this program, if I tell them one, they've heard the racist joke that I share. Then sometimes they'll give me one a lot. Even sometimes then they still will not do it. But I think that's a major pattern right there. And again, for him, he's somebody that's 70, 71. I mean, we're talking, he wasn't hearing these racist jokes when he was an infant. If you were born uh, in 1946, as he said he was, man, you're a teenager uh, when white people are saying nigga this and nigga that, that coon nigga Dr. King this and that coon uh Malcolm X and the rest of them uh, from that era, he had to be hearing this all the time. So I'm sure he could remember, you know, one, two, three, twelve, uh, that he could share. That's, you know, just a long way. Another way that they practice racism, white supremacy. Uh, any folks good? Professor Willimon, anything else to share there? Folks good? Right on. Uh, this, uh, this text also left out the role of white women. 
uh, in the practice of racism, white supremacy. This is really more focused on white men. But again, as I stated to him, this is not a book that I would recommend uh, victims of racism read anyway. It's not something that uh, will inform you or increase your understanding of racism. And he does a lot of practicing racism within the text as well. Uh, I did want to get in also, uh, someone emailed me during the program. This is not related to what we were talking about with Tiger Woods, uh, where they reported that he was arrested for DUI. And in the New York uh, Daily News report, uh, they wrote that he refused the breathalyzer. And that's an automatic arrest in Florida if you refuse breathalyzer. And I think it's in other states, too. If you refuse the breathalyzer, uh, you can be arrested. And he released a statement through his agent. He's out, he's out of custody now, but he released a statement where he said, I guess that's a cowbell, too, for Tiger Woods. Uh, he released a statement where he said that he was not under the influence. He had not been drinking, that he had been taking medication for back pain. He's had back surgery and a lot of well-documented back problems uh, through the years. He said he had been taking some pain medication that made that he just had a bad side effect from and, and made him a little drowsy or what have you. But he had not been consuming any alcohol and he cooperated with the police and hopes, you know, the whole thing will be resolved. But I point that out. A uh, listener wrote in, you know, that they racists, they can defile you and make you look really bad and be like, oh, my God, that Tiger Woods is, you know, the worst thing ever. How he's falling off now. He's some drunkard, I, you know, driving drunk, you know, could have killed someone um, where they can be really good at that. And then also on top of it, that's still another great uh, reminder of why sobriety is best. Even if you're not under the influence, racists can stop you, terrorize you and wow, we say you're drunk and that's that, you know, and impound and all that, you know, and then you got to go through all this rigmarole to prove that you are innocent. That's just another reason uh, to keep that in mind uh, as we go out and about. And as I had been saying, I think I, this was a week or two ago, someone uh, they sent me an article where enforcement officials they are getting training where they can be experts. Uh, and this is for like cannabis and other drugs where they can use their discretion to say, well, oh, I've been trained. And so I know the symptoms of a motorist who is impaired due to alcohol or drugs or whatever it is. So they can stop you and detain you and do all this stuff, even though they don't have like a test. They don't have a breathalyzer for cannabis. Uh, or other drugs, right? So they're saying that these folks have this training. And I said, man, that's, oh my gosh, like how that's going to be applied to black people. It'll be anything, uh, you know, that it looked like you were an inch too close uh, to the parking line, uh, or it looked like maybe you were a hair over the speed limit or anything. Uh, you know, it looks like your cup holder is a little crooked. So that looks like, you know, crackhead behavior. We got to stop you and, you know, we might have to take you in. Uh, just something to keep in mind. It's already so, so easy for white people to terrorize us. You don't want to do anything that might make it easier for them. I guarantee you, you being intoxicated, that will make it way easier. Uh, with that, anything else folks need to get in before we wrap or everyone satisfied? I'll assume folks are good. The name of the book that was written by the offspring of Senator Strom Thurmond and former governor uh, is Dear Senator, a memoir by the daughter of Strom Thurmond. Uh, and it came out in 2006. Uh, and again, unless I am, you know, way off, I think she did move here uh, to Washington State, Seattle specifically. Uh, I'll double check that. And that is for sure something we should maybe uh, do on the book club. This is everyone's favorite area of people activity. I'd be curious to see how much uh, accurate information uh, is in the book and, and how much detail is there. I'm even surprised a little bit myself that I haven't uh, read this book yet because I definitely know about it. Put that on the put that in the hopper uh, for a possible uh, book down the road. Um, I guess in the same vein, a listener shared a film with me. Reading is more important than watching television, but a listener shared a film with me. <clears throat> Came out in 2016. It's called Little Boxes. Little Boxes. This film is about a black male white woman they have a son he's like 12 i think they moved to washington state which is why i think the person uh sent it to me they moved to washington state but they don't go to seattle they go to i think like rome washington somewhere uh more rural uh seattle does not have a lot of black people period seattle is a very white state the little teaspoon of non-white people particularly black people tend to be in the western 
part of the state like where I am Seattle over here once you get away from that part you start going east it gets really really white so I think they moved to one of these really really white parts of uh, Washington State and it the whole movie is about how they adjust this quote unquote interracial family how they adjust to being in super white uh, Washington and their <clears throat> their uh, quote unquote interracial child son uh, how he adjusts to being around all these white children and uh, just fascinating, fascinating. I was uh, more interested just because, oh, this is Washington State where I am. So uh, that was why I got into it. But I howled. I cracked up laughing. It is one of the funniest movies that I've seen uh, about racism in a long time. It is, man, I laughed and laughed and laughed. I do have a slightly uh, warped sense of humor like i think uh driving miss davy driving miss daisy is one of the funniest movies that i've ever seen uh and i think it, many parts of it are intentionally done to be funny and racist at the same time uh but i think little boxes this film is funnier than that it is uh if you have the type of humor that i have it is absolutely hilarious and you will still learn quite a bit uh, about racism, white supremacy, but little boxes, you can check it out and drop me a, a word if you uh, have any thoughts or if anything stands out interesting about the film. Uh, again, we'll be back uh, two days, Workplace Racism, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. If you can't find something in the archives, if you have a guest suggestion, uh, if you have... <clears throat> A question, suggestion, gripe, uh, feel free to drop an email until justice at gmail dot com until justice at gmail dot com. Uh, if you dropped an email before, it didn't hear back. Let me know again. Uh, try to make sure I respond promptly. But I have missed email. Sometimes it goes to the spam trash, whatever it is. So drop a line if you did not hear back from Gus uh, with that again sobriety would be best for all of the reasons that I have laid out. If you're going to go out and have fun this summer, do so. Just remain codified. Again, race soldiers, white people, they are extremely dangerous. Badge or no. Keep that in mind uh, for the duration as long as white supremacy uh, exists. Uh, if you're going to have fun this summer, make sure you remain codified. With that, creator, we ask that you help us remain patient with other black people, victims of white supremacy, we ask that you help us remain patient with ourselves. Remind us to demonstrate the highest levels of black self-respect at all times, in all places, each and every time we are in contact with another black person. It has been time. Replace white supremacy with justice immediately. Cow signing out. Thanks all. For tuning in. Nigga, you so brainwashed. I'm a victim, Your brother. Problem. You're a victim. Uh, I'm a up. victim of 400 years of conditioning. Shut up. The man has programmed my conditioning. Mm -hmm. Even my conditioning has been conditioned. Yeah.